Yield to Shadow Shadowbound Series Book 2 By Sierra Graves Chapter 1 Finnick What do you mean? She's in a coma. Rose was yelling. In my ear. I pulled the phone. I mean, Harriet did something to her, and now she's trapped in her own mind. She's alive. Doesn't look like it, but she is, I added without thinking. She looks alive. What the hell happened, Finnick? Look, I'm working with the elders. We're going to get her back. She'll be fine. She better or I'm going to march my old lady self to that coven house and smack a witch. How could she do this to her own daughter? I don't know, but she's been taken into custody. I'm going to save her. I won't leave until she's back with us. How I was going to do that without my power, I hadn't the slightest idea. But it was the truth. No matter what it took, I was not leaving Beckett's side for a second. I'll call you when I have more news. Just stay calm until then. Stay calm, she shouted, then drop the volume. You're right, I'm sorry. I just care for her like she's my own. I can't lose her. Neither can I, I confessed. I'll call you soon. Bye, Rose. I disconnected the call and set Beckett's cell on the nightstand. I sat back down in the chair by her bedside and took her icy hand in mine. Frankie was perched at the foot of the bed on the wooden rail. His sadness at Beckett's state made the whole situation even worse. I'd come here to apologize to Beckett and beg for her to give me a second chance, only to find Harriet had blasted her mind into some alternate reality. A whole day had passed. Beckett's breathing and heartbeat remained the same. Sluggish at best. She appeared dead, she was so pale. I squeezed her hand, begging her to open her eyes, but she didn't. She couldn't even squeeze my hand back to let me know she was there. How did this happen? I muttered aloud, mostly to myself. Harriet's magic interacted poorly with hers, Frankie volunteered. I should track her down and infect her with venom. His body shifted and shimmered into that of the large tarantula. He paced along the footboard, cursing and venting the entire time, his eight feet tapping in quick succession back and forth. I was in complete agreement that he should cause Harriet some pain. Or a lot of it. I'd been racking my brain, trying to think of a way to pull Beckett from wherever she was. I was powerless, and aside from talking to Beckett, there was nothing I could do. Marie and the elders said they were working on a plan, but they had to tread carefully. They weren't entirely certain what Harriet's magic had done. That, plus the mind was tricky. If they attempted the wrong spell or gave Beckett the wrong potion, it could easily block her mind from returning. Or only bring some of it back. Or simply kill her altogether. I gave Beckett's hand another squeeze then stood, needing to move. I was more anxious than I'd been about anything in my life. I texted Garth a while ago, letting him know what was going on. He was on standby, in case there was anything he could do to help. I asked Marie, but she said even a demi might not be enough to save Beckett's mind. Frankie eventually shifted back to his large snail form, popped out of sight only to reappear on the nightstand. I'm supposed to protect her, he whispered. I failed. No, you didn't, I argued. Her mother failed. She treated her like an experiment instead of her daughter. You didn't do this, Frankie. She came here last night because of me. I drove her here early. But you saved her first. I did nothing. I wasn't sure how one consoled a snail. I rested my hand on his smooth shell. We'll find a way to bring her back. I swear we will. Ah! A woman's voice came from the doorway. You must be the Demi. Immediately, I moved to the foot of the bed to block the woman who bore a resemblance to Beckett from getting any closer. And you must be the bitch who cursed her own daughter. I suggest you get out of here right now. Or what? Her lips twitched as she took a step further into the room. You'll blast me with the magic you don't have. I can see your aura, and it is quite drained. You couldn't hurt a fly right now, even if you wanted to. My hands clenched at my sides. I told you to get out. 
What? Can't a mother come to check on the welfare of her only child? I moved to the right, blocking her when Harriet sidestepped to get to Beckett. She can, but you are not her mother, not anymore. Two witches around Beckett's age stood in the hall with four guards in dark gray suits. Why had they let Harriet come here in the first place? She should be nowhere near Beckett. Unless she had a way to help. From the satisfied glint in that woman's eyes, as she looked at Beckett over my shoulder, she was quite pleased with what she'd done. It's a shame, really. She was finally starting to show potential. But no matter. You bound her magic when she was a defenseless child, I snapped. She had potential all this time, and you shunned her because you just want more power. That's what she says, but sadly she can't say much of anything now. It doesn't matter if she can speak or not, Marie said, as she pushed through the two witches and entered the room. What are you doing down here? Who let you out? Harriet wiped at her eyes, as if she'd been crying. I wanted to see my daughter. And you tricked them into letting you out. No one's going to be fooled by you any longer. You ought to return to your quarters at once. We will deal with you once we've found a way to save your daughter. Unless, of course, you are willing to help. Who said I did this? Harriet rested a hand to her heart. Beckett's magic is what reacted poorly, not mine. You were trying to cast a second binding, Marie accused. The older woman stood to her full height as green sparks crackled at her fingertips, matching the sudden glow in her eyes. You have lost your place in this coven, that I can tell you for certain. You can't do that to me, Harriet yelled. I'm an elder. Or, Marie corrected. I wonder what other crimes you've been hiding from us all these years. And for what? Because of some vision an old oracle saw. It's prophecy, Harriet argued. It was Madeline, drunk after too many of her toxic potions one night. As she always does, Marie shot back. She said the same thing to countless others over the years. You are not the only one. By law, the elders must deliver these visions to those they concern, but no one believes them. We haven't had a true oracle among us in centuries. By the goddess, Harriet, I thought you were smarter than this. No, Harriet murmured as she held her baby bump. She told me I was different. She said I would give birth to great power. Yes, and I heard the same thing ten years ago. And just last week, actually, Marie mused. We all heard what Madeline spoke to you about. Why didn't you just ask us? I did. Not me. Marie rubbed her forehead, looking far more exhausted than she had a few minutes ago. I felt sorry for her, really. This mess could have been avoided if Harriet had just confirmed what she heard with the rest of her coven, instead of taking such prophetic words to heart. She essentially stole Beckett's life because of her eagerness for power. Harriet, I think it's time you return to your rooms now. You're lying, Harriet said. You're all lying to me. This child I'm carrying, she's going to be more powerful than any of you, you'll see. The crazed look in Harriet's eyes had me moving closer in case she decided to go after Beckett again. I might not be able to use my power, but I was a hell of a lot stronger than her physically. She was not going near her daughter. I'm sorry, Harriet, but you have been misguided. Had I realized it sooner? No, Harriet cut her off. No, I'm the strongest witch in this coven. And the smartest. I am the future of us all. Your words mean nothing to me. I know what I'm meant to do with my life. Marie sighed and reached out slowly for Harriet's shoulders. Whatever you say, dear, but you are returning to your rooms now. She motioned to the men in the suits, and they rushed forward, each taking hold of Harriet's arms. Take her to her rooms, and this time ensure she stays there. Harriet tensed as if she was going to bolt, but first, her narrowed gaze settled on me. You'll never save her, she whispered. Even if you bring her back, she'll always be weak. I shrugged and shoved my hands in my pockets. Good thing I'm not in love with her because of her magic then. Harriet's lips twisted as she opened her mouth, probably keep yelling at me. Instead, the guards began dragging her away. Her shouting echoed down the hall, 
until Marie shut the door to Beckett's room. I let out a heavy breath and turned back to Beckett. I replayed the words I shouted to her mom and still. Love. I said love. Shit, did I love her. I glanced to the right of the bed to see Frankie eyeing me. What? Nothing, just curious. I went back to sitting by Beckett's side. I held her hand as the truth settled over my shoulders like a comforting blanket. I'd only loved one person in my life, and that was my mother. But now I found someone I didn't think I could stand to be without, and she was beyond my power to save. Then again, maybe not. You said all the potions you could try on Beckett are dangerous, right? I asked Marie. Yes. This problem is going to take more than one night to resolve. What if you gave me a potion? Marie frowned. Why would we give you one? Beckett's mind is trapped in an alternate world. What if I go there too and bring her back? Can that work somehow? She hesitated. It's dangerous, Finnick. Very dangerous. Yeah, I might not come back or whatever, but it's worth it. I'm not going to let her be trapped there forever, not when I can do something to save her. Please, you have to let me try. Marie went to Beckett and rested her palm on her forehead. She shut her eyes and whispered under her breath. Beckett's body took on a soft green glow, but it faded within seconds. I fear the longer she's gone from her body, the slimmer our chances are of getting her back. We'll try this, but there's no guarantee it'll work. None. I can't keep sitting here doing nothing. I kiss the back of Beckett's ice-cold hand. I'll accept the consequences of whatever happens. Marie backed away from the bed. I'll see the potion prepared. It'll take a couple of hours. She exited, leaving me alone with Beckett. Well, mostly alone. Frankie remained on the nightstand, his little eyes watching me intently. I was growing used to the snail's presence, but right then I wished he would go away. If there was a chance I wasn't coming back, I needed to make a phone call. Can you give me a minute? I asked Frankie. Frankie seemed to be thinking about something very intently. I'll be back before you take the potion, he said, then disappeared with a quiet popping sound. I fished my cell out of my pocket and called the asylum. Dr. Gillis, he said after the first ring. Hey, it's Finnick. I need you to do me a favor. Finnick, what's wrong? You don't sound well. A lot's going on right now, but I'll tell you about it later. Right now, I need you to write a note for my mother. Can you do that? A note? Finnick, are you in some kind of trouble? I ran a hand through my hair as I watched Beckett. Not me a friend. More than a friend. Can you just please write this all down, and if for some reason this doesn't work, make sure the next time my mother's lucid, you give it to her. Please. All right, I'm ready when you are, he said, though he didn't sound happy about it. I took a deep breath and thought about what I wanted to tell my mother in case this all went wrong, and I ended up trapped with Beckett. Just tell her that I never blamed her for anything, I finally said. And that I love her, and I'm sorry I couldn't find a way to free her mind. Gillis muttered under his breath quietly, then said, Finnick, why does this note sound like you might be about to die? What's going on? If I make it back in one piece, I'll tell you the whole story. Thanks for taking care of her. Finnick. I hung up before he could say anything else. I texted Garth too, and let him know that I was sorry again for what happened at the park. I told him he was really the only friend I ever had, and that if he didn't hear from me over the next few days, not to worry. He called me about ten seconds after I sent the text, but I didn't answer. I turned off my cell and paced around the room. My entire life had been spent planning a way to get revenge against Dion. Now I found myself ready to risk everything for the unconscious witch in the room with me. I waited for a moment of doubt to creep in and tell me I was behaving like an idiot. But it never came. If anything, my determination to prove to Beckett and everyone else that I wasn't a self-centered jackass grew even stronger until I was bouncing on the balls of my feet like Beckett would do.
For the first time in my life, I was thinking of someone other than myself. If I was going to be honest, all my talk about saving my mother was more about saving myself than her. It was terrible, but there it was. The hard truth no son would ever want to admit. As much as I wanted her mind to be clear again, it was mostly for my benefit. I couldn't stand to see her in pain. She had found a way to cope with her mental instability. I never had. Beckett hadn't asked to be separated from her body or to be attacked by the one woman who was supposed to love her. I'm going to bring you back, I told Beckett firmly as I kissed her forehead. I'll do whatever I have to do to show you that I'm sorry and I was wrong. So damn wrong. I want to be with you, Beckett, you hear me. I want you. I thought I saw her hand twitch. I looked at it long and hard, waiting, but there was no more movement. My mind must have been playing tricks on me. Another three hours passed before Marie and several other elders finally returned. Glass in hand. Smoke puffs rose from the glass, and when I peered inside my stomach turned. That's what I have to drink? Yes. Once it's in your system, you'll fall into the same coma that she's in. Then how will I bring us back? Marie reached to an elder behind her. With this. When she faced me again, there was a gold rope lying across her palm. We're going to tie this to you. When your mind goes to this alternate realm, the rope will still be attached to you. Once you find Beckett, tug on it, and we'll yank you both free. And if this doesn't work for some reason, if I can't find her, then you come back alone. We're still working on other ways to bring her back to us if you're having second thoughts. No, this sounds like our best option. Marie nodded. It'll be the safest for her, yes. Trying to reach her any other way or jerking her out of that world could end in catastrophe. Once you get in there, whatever you do, do not step into the fog. Fog? If she's where we think she is, the fog will take her further away from us. Stay away from it. I took the potion and lifted it in a toast to the elders. I chugged the chunky potion down, gagging the whole time, then shuddered at the bitter aftertaste. Marie helped me tie the rope around my waist, then guided me to the chair. Exhaustion overcame me and I slumped onto the bed. I opened my mouth to ask how long it'd take me to pass out. Instead, my head fell forward. The second it hit the bed, I jerked upright and looked around confused. Marie? I was in the same room, sitting in the same chair. The light was dim and off-color. Beckett's body was gone from the bed. The elders were missing, too. I stood slowly and glanced into the hallway. This is weird, I muttered to myself. Everything was in shades of gray. Torchlight flickered along the walls, but it wasn't warm and bright. Guess I'm here, wherever here is. Once I checked the rope to be sure it was still tied around my waist, the end of it trailing back to the chair, I headed down the hall in search of Beckett. Chapter 2 Beckett I ground my teeth as I wandered through the gardens, out the back gate, then made my way to the front of the coven house. Again. I'd walked around the grounds ten times now, through the entirety of the house twice, and tried to leave through the front gate five times. The damn things were locked. The fog beyond them was too thick to see through. It could be a bad idea to step into it. Then again, it'd get me away from the current annoyance hanging around me. Going through those gates might be my way home. I glared down the front walk and wondered if the sixth time would be the charm. You know it's not going to work, just like everything else you've tried, a voice said. I dug my nails into my palms and forced myself to face forward. You're not really here, so just shut up already and leave me alone. Of course I'm here. Why wouldn't I be? I rolled my eyes as the figure that appeared as my mother traipsed around until she stood right in front of me. She'd shown up a while ago, was just suddenly standing there. As far as I could tell, I was in some alternate reality. This version of my mother was somehow being projected from my mind, along with a few other random witches who were now wandering the grounds. None of them were real though, not like me. Just move, I muttered and shoved past her. 
Is that any way to talk to your mother? She asked, keeping up with me easily enough. You are not my mother, and even if you were, I'm disowning you. So you're still not my mother. Going to hold it against me, forever, huh? Just like that. After everything I've done for you. I whirled around, ready to blast her away from me, but no magic sparked to life at my fingertips. It didn't work here, wherever here was. Go away, all right? Just go away. It's bad enough you sent me here in the first place. I didn't do this. You did it to yourself. Right, because you're not the one who bound my powers for years. I could be a great witch right now. But no, you had to take matters into your own hands and now look at me. I spread my arms wide and looked around the depressing gray world I found myself in. This is all your fault because you're crazy and selfish, and you're not even really here, I ended lamely. None of this is real. But it is real, just not your version of reality, she replied, tagging along as I charged for the front gate. You know, even if you make it through that gate, you probably shouldn't go through it. Oh no? And why would I listen to you? Because in a way, I'm you. I stopped, my hands on the solid metal bars of the front gate. What do you mean, you're me? You're not me. I wouldn't be beating myself up right now about what a failure I turned out not to be, I snapped. Harriet shrugged. I'm just a projection. Of what, how I see my mother. I stepped back and really looked at this version of my mother. She looked exactly like the real Harriet, but everything she'd said to me since she appeared was exactly what I imagined my mother saying to me any time I got myself into a situation like this. All right, fine, you're me. Whatever. Can you please just go away then? Nope, can't do that. Why the hell not? I yelled with a groan. Because this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And like I said, I wouldn't go through those gates if I were you. Why? Will they get me away from you? Probably, but you might not find your way back. You really want me to be right? I pressed my hands to the lock on the gate and imagined it breaking in two. I pictured the gate swinging outward and letting me escape from this place. There was nothing out there but dense fog and what appeared to be a bright light attempting to penetrate it. I had to get back to my world. That could be the doorway to do so. Out there beyond these damn gates. You'll just be trapped here forever, Harriet went on, pressing her face to the bars. I'll have your little sister and she'll turn out to be the prodigy I always wanted. And you, well, you'll fade away into nothing. I won't even tell your sister about you. What would be the point? You're nothing. Just a failed experiment. Just someone who can't even save herself. In the past, I might have given in to those taunts, but now that I knew the truth, all I did was laugh. I can save myself. I can do anything I want to now because I'm free. Fine then, do what you want. Don't let me stop you. She backed away from the gate and waved me on. Let's see just what the great Beckett Jenkins can do. The first five times I failed at opening the gate, but I was pretty sure I'd been holding back. Now, I grabbed hold of the bars and continued to picture the gate's opening. The metal warmed in my grip, and the lock creaked and groaned as it twisted. A loud clank sounded. Suddenly, the lock was on the ground at my feet. I hadn't expected that to happen. Maybe I could use a bit of magic here, after all. I just had to be in the right state of mind. Whatever. The gate was unlocked now. I could leave. I pushed on one side and it swung outward, inviting me into the unknown. I think it's best if you stay here, I told Harriet. I can do this alone. She simply smiled and clasped her hands before her. I took a deep breath, lifted my foot, and made ready to step out into that fog. Beckett. Don't. Finnick. I turned around to see him sprinting toward me from the front porch. Great, now I'm imagining you. How worse can this place get? I held up my hand to stop the Finnick hallucination from getting any closer. Nope, I don't want to see you. I don't care if my mind drummed you up for some reason. I'm ignoring any and all feelings I have for you, so just go away. 
I know I messed up at the park, he said in a rush, stopping just short of me. I know, and I'm sorry, and I'll apologize more once we get out of here, but we have to go. Now. I backed away from him, and closer to the gate. I said no. He frowned then glanced at Harriet. How is she here? She's supposed to be locked up. I rolled my eyes, not in the mood to deal with any of this anymore. She's not really here. Some part of my subconscious or something. I don't know, doesn't matter. She's not real, and neither are you. I turned around, and went to take a step out of the gate again. Finnick grabbed hold of my hand and yanked me back off my feet. What are you doing? I yelled and shoved away from him, but he only held on tighter. The fog is dangerous, and I'm real Beckett, he insisted as he set me down, but placed himself between me and the gate. No, you're just some messed up part of my mind trying to make me think you're real. He pressed my hand to his chest. I'm real. I came here to get you out, after your mother blasted you here. Remember? You came here to talk to the elders, and she attacked you. Now you're lying on a bed at the coven house. You look like death. And the elders aren't sure how to make you wake up. I blinked a few times as I digested what he said, keeping my hand right where it was. They sent you to get me. Why? I sent myself. I came to the coven house to beg you to forgive me for being an asshole, and I found you trapped in this place. His gaze shifted around, taking in the dreary landscape. They said you can't be here too long, or it'll damage your mind. You could stay trapped in here forever. I don't understand. Why? Why what? Why did I come after you? He hung his head for a second, then when he raised it again, those shifting green-blue eyes and the depth of emotion in them stole my breath away. Why the hell do you think? Gee, I don't know. The last time I saw you, you were yelling at me. He tugged me even closer, and his sudden kiss cut off the rest of my rant. Whereas everything else in this strange world felt cold, Finnick's lips were warm against mine. I started to pull him closer. Then I remembered everything he'd said to me in the park. I shoved him away and shook my head. This does not mean you're off the hook, I warned him. He gave me one of those charming smiles. Never thought it would. Good. I waited for a beat, then snagged him by his shirt and dragged him back to me. I wrapped my arms around his neck as he picked me up and spun me around. Once I was back on my feet, I leaned away from him and narrowed my eyes. You have a lot of making up to do. And I promise I'll do it, but can we please get you out of here? I tried not to let him see how elated I was that he was the one who came after me. Yeah, but how? You don't have your powers anymore. The elders. He held up a gold rope I hadn't even noticed attached to his waist. He gave it a hard tug, and a second later it was tugged back. Time to go. Holding onto his hand, I followed him away from the front gate and back to the coven house. My mother's doppelganger stayed by the gate, waving at us with a weird twisted smile on her face. I turned away quickly and focused on the rope. Why are we going here? I asked, when we reached the doorway of one of the guest rooms at the coven house. Finnick nodded to the bed. That's where you currently are. I'm in the chair next to you. Ready to get out of here? You have no idea. He started forward but I stopped him. Once we're back we should talk. Seriously talk. He kissed my cheek sweetly. We will. I wasn't sure how this was going to work, since I'd never had my mind thrown into an alternate world before. But once we stood right where Finnick said he'd come through, a white glow appeared. It grew until it was large enough for us to pass through. Hand in hand we stepped through the portal. I gasped and shot upright, looking around wildly. Marie was there, along with two other elders, one of them a healer. He pressed his hand to my forehead. She's back and she's fine. No permanent damage. Finnick. I felt a hand catch mine. Right here. He sat in a chair beside the bed, shaking his head. That was a trip. I smiled but pulled my hand free. We really needed to talk about a lot of things, 
before either one of us became too distracted by any roller coaster of emotions. With Marie's help, I stood. My legs wobbled and my stomach growled loudly. How long was I gone? I asked as it growled again. Think I could eat a ton? Finnick laughed, along with Marie. Over a day now, she answered. How about we fix you to a nice meal? I was fine with getting some food in me. It would give me a chance to figure out what exactly I wanted to say to Finnick. The longer I looked at him, the more bits and pieces of our argument in the park came back to me. The words we'd thrown at each other were harsh, and I'd smacked him in the end. Why had he shown up here? And that kiss, my lips were still tingling as we wound our way through the coven house to the main kitchen. Finnick said nothing the entire way and gave me space as if sensing my uncertainness. Unless he wasn't so sure about coming here after all. Or kissing me. Or anything else. I groaned at my overactive brain, then realized everyone heard that. Finnick smiled as he glanced away. Marie gave me a questioning look. I ignored them and sat down at the table. A full meal later, Marie was finally satisfied I wasn't going to suddenly drop dead or drift back to an alternate reality. Marie stood to leave, she asked if I wanted to see my mother. Eventually I did, but not today. Today, I had other issues to deal with. One of which was across the table from me, giving me a curious look as he shoved his hands in the pockets of his jeans. She left us alone in the kitchen. Finnick hadn't said anything the entire time Marie had been filling me in on what was going on with Harriet. The real Harriet. Currently, she was being held under house arrest here at the Coven House. She would remain here while the elders investigated the accusations against her. All of it, the prophecy my mother had been told, what her child was meant to do, these were the mad ramblings of an intoxicated oracle. Nothing more. Harriet had bound my powers and made my life hell for nothing. I wanted her to remain locked up as long as possible. How about a walk? I suggested my palm sweaty with nerves. Doesn't sound like you've seen much of this place. It has some good parts. I wouldn't want you to miss them, since this might be your only time here. Walk sounds good. I led the way out of the kitchen and to the grounds through a side door. Night had fallen, but many witches were outside, surveying the stars and the planets, casting spells that required the light of the full moon, or were simply enjoying the strange warmth to the evening air. Finnick stayed by my side as we meandered silently along the garden paths, past tall orange tiger lilies, a vast array of tulips and large rose bushes, then onto the orchard. I rested my hand against the bark of an apple tree and paused. Red and green apples littered the ground, while still more hung from the branches making them hang low with the weight. I remembered coming out here, as a little girl and gathering up as many as I could in my arms. That had been back when I thought my mother loved me. Absently, I kicked an apple and watched it roll away, just like the rest of my happy memories of my parents. I am sorry, Finnick said as he leaned his shoulder against another tree close by. That's why you came here last night? Yeah. He ran his hands through his hair and couldn't meet my gaze. I know I said some shit after Karina stole my power, and none of it's true. I was just pissed off, and I wasn't thinking clearly, but you didn't deserve to be yelled at like that, and you're sure as hell not a failure. I picked at a piece of bark. I sort of have been up until now. No, you haven't. He marched over and took hold of my hands. You are an incredible woman and witch, even though you had limited access to your magic. I've never met anyone like you, and if you can forgive me for being a jackass, he said with a hint of a smile playing across his lips, then I would really like to try being your boyfriend again. I leaned in closer as I whispered, you sure about that? I might drive you nuts with bubbles. You know, I kind of like when bubbles magically appear around me. Ha, huh, very funny, I muttered but he wasn't smiling. A seriousness took over his face that made my heart skip a beat. Finnick? When I first got here I thought you were dead, he told me. You look dead. You weren't really breathing, and you were so damn pale. I thought, he trailed off breathing out heavily through his nose. 
I thought I'd lost my chance with you because I drove you to come here early. I let you face down Harriet alone. We were supposed to do this together, and I messed it up for you. I was pissed, I said, not afraid to let him know how I felt. But I'm not ready to be finished with you just yet. I am sorry Karina stole your power. I never wanted that to happen. I think I deserved it. No, you didn't. It doesn't matter, he said, and tucked my hair behind my ears. I would do it all again if it meant freeing you. I know I might not have shown it well in the last 48 hours, but I care for you a lot, Beckett. He shrugged as he added quietly, kind of scares me. I scare you? This, whatever this is going on between us? This scares me. I've never let myself care for someone, because I didn't think I could handle it. The way he cast his eyes downward and began to pull away told me exactly why that was. You're not your dad, you know. Feels like it some days. Well, maybe if you stopped bouncing around from woman to woman, I said with a straight face as he flinched. Then I burst out laughing, and he let his head fall. I'm just giving you shit. Finnick, I get it, I do. You're not the only one who has a parent you want to distance yourself from. Distraction, he whispered. What? He let go of my hands and walked away, rubbing the back of his neck. I only ever wanted to be distracted from my own problems. It was why I bounced around so much. I just needed something, anything to take my mind off my mother losing hers and dad being a heartless wretch. Are you saying I'm only a distraction? He whirled around an argument on his lips, but then he grinned when he realized I was smiling. I'm saying I want you. Just like that. You want me. Yeah, I do. Got a problem with it? he asked as he stalked closer. My breath came quicker, and my legs grew a bit wobbly. As long as you know I want you just as much. And that we are going to get your power back. I'm not going to let that evil bitch win. I might drive you crazy, by the way. I tend to do that around the people I care about. Beckett. Huh? What? Shut up, he whispered. He took my hand and pulled me against his chest. His lips covered mine and I melted into his arms, lost in what was between us. We backed into the nearest tree, he nuzzled my neck, I saw stars and wished we weren't in the orchard at the coven house. Then he started laughing and I frowned. What? I'm never going to get tired of seeing that. I wasn't sure what he was talking about until they floated into view. Bubbles. We were surrounded by shimmering violet and blue bubbles. Finnick continued to chuckle until I turned him back to me and kissed him. He rested his forehead to mine, those always shifting eyes of his drawing me in until I was lost. If you can't stop grinning like that, someone's going to know we were just kissing on the grounds, Finnick whispered in my ear. I smiled even wider. Maybe I don't care. Good because I don't either. We walked hand in hand toward the coven house. I'd been more than happy to remain in the orchard a bit longer, but then the sky began to lighten. The first hint of pink appeared on the horizon, and we'd both burst out laughing. We stayed out there all night. Now I was tired and hungry all over again. I aimed for the kitchens, hoping they'd be empty. They weren't. Many of the witches eyed us curiously and whispered behind their hands. I grabbed us some coffee, then high-tailed it out of there to take back the guest room I'd been using. Once the door was closed, I sat at the foot of the bed as Finnick paced slowly around the room. The weight of his problems was quickly settling back on his shoulders. We'll get your power back, I promised him again. I know, but I don't want you getting hurt in the process. You don't think I can take Karina now? He scowled at me, and I inwardly sighed. Right. Finnick was definitely going to be one of those overprotective boyfriends. I'd prefer you not to try, but I have a feeling I'm not going to have a say on the matter. You'd be correct in that. He rolled his eyes at me, but his lips tugged up in a smile. We'll figure something out, but promise me you won't try and go after her alone. I don't like what I sensed from her. I won't. I give you my word as a witch. He nodded 
but still appeared uneasy as he started pacing again. I set my coffee mug aside and sat cross-legged on the bed, watching. Tell me about them. About your parents. About your mom. I did tell you about them. I nodded slowly. You yelled at me about them. He stopped short and muttered something under his breath that sounded like a stream of curses. Yeah, sorry. You already apologized. He set his mug down on the chest of drawers beside him, then leaned against the wall. According to my mother, she met Dion when she just turned 18. He's always fancied the arts and hangs around college campuses, subway stations, any place where people are being creative. At least he used to. I'm not sure what he does anymore. Anyway, he went on roughly, he met my mother during her first semester of art school. She was up on the roof at night, all alone. This time when he smiled, there was so much sadness and bitterness in it, I nearly went to him. Something told me he needed to get through this first, and I forced myself to stay put. He told her he was a fellow student, and they talked. For weeks he'd search for her on campus, usually up on the roof at night, and they'd just talk. She told me it went on for years. That doesn't sound like Dion's style. It's not. Something about my mother made him change his tune. Then, as my mother put it, he took her hand one night, pulled her from her seat and kissed her. She said it was like nothing she'd ever felt before. A few months after that, when she moved out of the dorms, she said they ended up back at her apartment one night. He'd filled the place with lilies, her favorite flower, and they well, you know, he said, his cheeks reddening. Yep, got it. Good. He rubbed his neck and finally sat down in the chair near the bed. That went on for another few months when she said he finally confessed what he was. She said she didn't believe him and he showed her. Told her everything. Right around that time, she found out she was pregnant with me. And he dumped her? He shook his head. Not according to my mother, but honestly, I don't know what to believe anymore. I don't know what's real or what she's created in her head. When did she start losing her mind? I was maybe 10. I noticed she was forgetting things, acting strangely. Her drawings were the big tell. They became dark and twisted. Then she quit drawing altogether. Dion stopped by every now and then, but his visits were so infrequent, and each time he left it made my mother worse. He knocked his fist absent-mindedly against his thigh, as his face twisted into an angry scowl. When I was old enough, Dr. Gillis, who looks after my mother, told me what he thought happened. That Dion caused the madness. And from that point on, you hated him, I finished quietly. Finnick, I'm so sorry. I confronted him once. I was about sixteen or so. Asked him why he did it. You know what he did. I shook my head, almost scared to know the answer from the way Finnick's hands curled into fists. He scoffed and said I understood nothing, then disappeared. He was never a father to me. I wasn't sure what to say in this situation, so I said nothing. That seemed to be the right choice. Finnick finally let his hands relax. I just want him to pay, he whispered. I want him to understand how much pain he's caused, and I need him to make the madness stop. Dr. Gillis keeps telling me the madness is getting worse. Eventually, she won't remember anything. Not me, not who she is. Nothing. I can't let that happen. All while he was talking, a nagging started in the back of my mind. Madness. I'd read something recently, but I couldn't fully remember what it was. Finnick? Hum? Can I meet your mom? He hesitated, but when he raised his gaze to mine, the amount of trust I saw was beyond any I'd ever seen from a single person in my life. Yeah, I've meant to go see her anyway. You don't think you can help her, do you? He asked, perking up. I don't want to say yes and get your hopes up. If I can meet her, there's a chance I might be able to do something. Not cure her, but I can't just sit here and do nothing while she's suffering. He took my hand. Thanks. For what? All I've seemed to do since meeting you is make a bigger mess. I think I can live with that, he replied with a smile. Great. How about we catch a few hours of sleep, then we'll head to the asylum. 
Chapter 3 Finnick I'd woken up before Beckett and went to use the bathroom at the coven house. I took a quick shower to freshen up and hoped it would ease my nerves about what we were going to do. It didn't. By the time I returned to the room, Beckett was gone, but Frankie was back. He told me she went to get cleaned up and would be back in a minute. I took the time to find my cell and call Garth to give him a quick update. He answered on the second ring. Hey man. What's going on? That damn text you sent was a bit cryptic, and then you didn't answer your phone. I know, I'm sorry. Beckett's back though. She is. Yeah, I'll give you the details later, but she's back and we've made up. I wanted to see if you and I were good. He let out a relieved sigh. Yeah, man, we're good. Don't scare me like that again. She forgave you. Did she deck you first? Surprisingly, no. Listen, I'm taking her to meet my mother today. Afterward, we're going to start working on a plan to get my powers back from Karina. I might need your help. You in? If it means getting revenge against that twisted witch, yeah, I'm in. Good. I'll call you when we have a plan, I told him. And thanks. For what? For kicking my ass when I needed it. Call you soon. I hung up as the door opened. Beckett entered. She wasn't wearing her extravagant outfit from yesterday anymore, but was back to leather pants and a black sweater that hung off her shoulder. Her hair was damp and wavy from her recent shower. Garth's on board, I said. Good. I have no idea what we're doing yet, but extra backup will be nice. I think Garth and I will get along just fine. I'm not sure that's a good thing, I muttered. She tugged on knee-high black boots. Don't worry. I won't ask him too many questions about you. Just a hundred or so. He's a good demi. Frankie said from the nightstand, nodding, then adding he'd be back at the loft waiting for us. He left the room, and I was left exchanging a curious look with Beckett. Ha, huh, he's never said that before. About anyone, she mused. At least Frankie hadn't told Beckett about my love confession. I'd have to thank him later. That was something I wanted to tell her when I was ready. After the craziness of the last few days, Voicing those three words might change everything. She felt strongly for me that I did know. But I didn't want her to feel pressured into saying it back. Finnick, are you ready to go? Yeah, sorry. Let's get back to Seattle. How did you get here, by the way? She asked as we exited the room, her hand tucked in mine. Took a cab. Seriously? And they just dumped you in the middle of nowhere. Guy probably thought I was crazy. Are we taking another cab? I asked. She bounced on the balls of her feet once we were outside. Nope, no cab. She stretched her hands in front of her, then shook them out. Time for some real witchy magic. Her eyes took on a dark violet glow as she aimed her hands at the ground. Symbols appeared on the stone walkway, forming a circle around her. Tendrils of electrified magic rose from them, and when they met over her head, she held out her hand for mine. Ready? I took her hand and stepped into the circle with her. The charge of magic made my hair stand on end. Then she dropped her other hand, and the coven house vanished. My feet left the ground for a split second, and when they touched down again, we were inside the garden walls of the asylum. The main building stood about twenty yards away. That was quite impressive, I complimented Beckett. Oh, that. That was nothing. Easy transportation spell, she said lightly but couldn't stop from smiling. I lifted her chin with my fingers, then brushed my lips against hers. You are impressive is what I meant to say, I whispered. Thanks. Feels good using magic. Feels really good. She glanced at the building behind us. Ready? Nope, but we're going anyway. We entered the building together and I signed us in. Ellis was at the front desk, and the moment she spotted Beckett, her friendly demeanor shifted. She glared openly at Beckett, who I could tell was trying her hardest not to cackle like a witch in those damned witch stories. How's she been? 
I asked Ellis to try and pull her glare away from Beckett. You'll have to ask Dr. Gillis, she replied curtly and turned her back to us. As we headed deeper into the building and toward my mother's room, Beckett finally let loose. Let me guess. She was one of your distractions. Don't judge me too harshly, all right? Nope, no judging here. Should I be worried any of these women are going to come after me? Aside from Karina cursing me? No, the rest of them will probably refrain. Good to hear. I couldn't blame her, really. Ellis's reaction was a bit over the top. I doubted the others would react any less dramatic when they all learned I was in a relationship. I stopped short of my mother's room when I noticed the door was open. That's weird. Should we go in? I let go of Beckett's hand and knocked on the open door. Mom? I called as the door swung inward. There was no answer. I bit back my disappointment. Flora. It's Finnick. The sound of shuffling papers drew my attention to the bay windows, where I usually found my mother sketching away. But it wasn't my mother standing there. I didn't see her at all. My gaze zeroed in on the back of a certain god's head, and suddenly I was charging into the room, bellowing in fury. Beckett was right behind me, yelling, but the rushing in my ears prevented me from comprehending her. When I reached the god standing across the apartment, I snatched the sketches out of his hands and shoved him away from the easel. What the hell are you doing here, huh? I slapped the papers down on a nearby table. Get out. Get out of here right now. Dion, one of the many gods that was supposed to watch over this world, who happened to be my father, rose to his full height of six and a half feet tall. The godly power flowing through his veins gave off an aura that pressed in around me. His broad shoulders blocked out the light coming in through the window. His beard was dark blonde, but not as perfectly groomed as I remembered. The rest of his hair was messy, too. He wore jeans and a dark blue flannel shirt that matched the sad shade his eyes were at the moment. He held his hands out as if he was going to ward me off and seemed to hesitate in the face of my rage. It threw me off and I stumbled over whatever else I'd been about to yell. Dion glanced over my shoulder. His eyes narrowed. Then his gaze returned to me. Finnick, why are you here? I demanded. She doesn't need you. He lowered his hands. I waited for the anger that usually came with these encounters. Only there was no anger, not this time. He seemed to deflate instead, then he staggered back a step. I've been so careful all this time. Dr. Gillis said you were keeping your distance. I was, but I needed to see her. Why are you here? I repeated. I check in from time to time, he replied quietly. How can I not? I don't know, maybe because you're the reason she's here. I crossed my arms and wished more than anything I had my power. Lashing out at him would be stupid. He'd knock me on my ass with a snap of his fingers, but standing here doing nothing except yelling at him wasn't good enough. Don't speak to me of things you do not understand, he seethed through gritted teeth. There was the anger. Do not lecture me, son. I'm not your son, I snapped. He bristled and squared his shoulders. You are. Whether you like it or not. I spat at his feet and leered. I don't want you coming here ever again, you hear me. Leave her alone. Why can't you just leave her alone? She is mine to look after. The hell she is, I yelled and stomped closer. You're kidding, right? You can't stand there and tell me you're taking care of her. Look around, asshole. I do, every time I come to visit. His brow furrowed and his hands curled into fists. You want to hit me? I taunted and lifted my chin. Go for it. I'm sure she'd love to know you and I came to blows the next time she's lucid. If she ever is again. Finnick, Beckett called from behind me. Dion's fists shook at his sides, but he stepped back again. You understand nothing. He turned away from me and headed for the door. I should have let him go, but I was too consumed by my anger to let him leave. I wanted an explanation. 
I wanted him to understand the pain he caused me and my mother. This time, I wasn't letting him walk away until I said my piece. Every other time I'd seen him at festivals or godly gatherings, he ignored me, and I never had the chance to tell him how I felt. How I really felt all these years. This was my time, and he was going to listen. Beckett, stop him, I shouted. Dion didn't slow down at my words. He continued for the door. Beckett gave me a sideways glance, but her eyes were already glowing a deep violet that matched her hands. She whispered a spell, and ropes shot out from her fingertips and wound their way around Dion. They held him in place as she raised more from the floor to trap him. The bonds glowed brightly, pulsing with her magic. She struggled to hold the god, biting her lip as her brow wrinkled. Won't last forever, she muttered. Release me, witch, Dion snapped, but Beckett held on. You don't want to do this, he said to me as I approached. You will regret it. The only thing I regret is not doing it sooner. I looked him right in the eye as the pent-up anger and bitterness and sadness for the man who was meant to be a loving father poured out of me. How dare you leave us? How dare you stand there and talk to me about my mother after what you did to her? To both of us. Finnick, Dion started, but I slashed my hand through the air, cutting him off. I don't care, you hear me. I don't care about your excuses. You are a selfish, arrogant bastard who has no right coming here after what you did. You, I uttered, voice shaking with rage as I pointed a finger at his face, you're the reason for all of this. I hate you. Do you know that? I hate you with every fiber of my being. I won't rest until you pay. You broke her, I added on a whisper. You know that? You took a woman with so much promise and love in her heart, and you broke her into pieces that no one can put back together. Dion hung his head and sagged within the magical bonds trapping him. Beckett gave me a frantic look. I assumed to let me know the ropes were going to give any second now. I'd said what I wanted to say. I nodded toward the door for us to go and let him get free, but when Dion lifted his head, I froze. A single tear slipped from the corner of his eye and left a wet path down his face. I'm sorry, he whispered, then sucked in a sharp breath. It wasn't supposed to happen. None of this was. Flora is my world. I did this to her. I blinked confused. What? He sniffed hard and then more tears flowed. Not once in my life had I seen him show any emotion aside from joy or arrogance, and here he was crying. Without my asking, Beckett let him go. Dion slumped forward, falling to his knees on the hard floor. With wide eyes, Beckett nodded toward my father and raised her brow. I shook my head, and she crossed her arms, glowering at me. I shrugged, not about to comfort this man, not yet at least. What are you saying? I finally asked. Resting his hands on his thighs, he straightened to meet my eyes. We need to talk, Finnick. Twenty minutes after I shouted at Dion, we left my mother's room in case she came back. We found ourselves outside in the gardens. There was no need for her to discover the three of us there. Depending on her current mental state, it could do more harm than good. We sat at one of the many patio tables scattered about. Beckett kept eyeing me and Dion as if making ready to intervene if this conversation turned into a fistfight. I wasn't past decking him, but for some reason, I was letting him talk to me. You said you wanted to talk, I said, knocking my knuckles on the stone table. So talk. He rubbed his eyes, and when his hand fell to the table, all I saw was exhaustion and a dark, deep depression left behind on his face. Flora changed my world when I met her, he said gently, looking off into the gardens. She's more than an amazing human. She's an incredibly gifted and strong woman. I know. She raised me, remember. Finnick, Beckett whispered, taking my hand. Let him talk. I ground my teeth but kept my mouth shut. Dion took a deep breath and let it out slowly. I had never fallen for anyone as I fell for her. She did something to me. I felt alive for the first time in centuries. He smiled as he spoke, but the heavy cloud of sadness remained. The way her laughter would warm me from the inside out. 
and that smile. He shook his head slowly. Her stubbornness and her temper, I fell for every bit of her. I never thought I would love a mortal, but I do. I never stop. I scoffed. If you love her, then why did you hurt her? His eyes narrowed and shifted uneasily in his chair. You know gods cannot linger in the mortal world for more than 24 hours. It drains our life source the longer we're here. Trust me, I tried. I attempted to find any way I could to stay here for long stretches of time. But your mother found out it was harming me, and she threatened to throttle me herself if I didn't keep myself alive for her and you. I opened my mouth, but Beckett squeezed my hand so hard I winced. I bit back what I wanted to say and let Dion continue. Our love continued to grow, especially after you were born. Seeing her holding you as a babe, it was like the whole world stood still just for me. As the years went on, my having to leave began to take its toll on both of us. I'd stay for several days, but the strain on my being was high. The longer I tried to remain with Flora, the longer I had to stay away to recharge. He cleared his throat roughly, and I sensed he was remembering those times. Every time I left, it hurt her. Hurt us both. I could take the pain, but I hated what it did to your mother. A small part of me wanted to call him a liar, but the pain he was letting me see was real. Bit by bit, the hatred I held onto all these years began to slip away. Why is she losing her mind? Abruptly, he stood from the table and turned his back to us. I wanted to lessen her pain, that was all. I worked my power on her, so each time I left, she wouldn't feel it as much. Numb her a bit. All I wanted was to keep her happy, but something went wrong. How? Beckett asked. My power interacted poorly with her mind. I think she knew what I was doing and subconsciously fought against it. When he turned back around, his face scrunched up in anger, but it wasn't directed at us. I attempted to remove it, but it was too late. The damage was done. Every time I returned, I watched a bit more of my flora, my love, slip away from me. For the last twenty years, I've been searching for a way to save her, but I've failed her. And I've failed you. The great god Dion crumbled right before my eyes. He leaned heavily on the stone table, as if it was the only thing keeping him upright. Love is not a farce the gods invented, he mumbled, and I sensed Beckett tense in her chair. It's real, Finnick. It's real, and I know I can't expect you to ever forgive me, but I love your mother. And you are my son. I know I haven't been much of a father. I couldn't stand to have you look at me the way you are now. I know about love being real, I replied, and looked at Beckett. Found that out for myself just recently. I held my breath, unsure of how she would react. For a long five seconds, she simply looked at me. Then she broke into the smile I was coming to enjoy. And I don't know if I can forgive you yet, but I'm willing to work on us, I told Dion. He nodded slowly. I would like that very much. Oh, hello there. Such a nice day, isn't it? Dion straightened and turned around. Flora sat in a wheelchair, being pushed by Dr. Gillis. She smiled at Dion, then at me and Beckett. I returned her smile. Unable to get any words past the lump in my throat. That it is. How are you feeling today, Flora? Dion asked. Flora sighed as Dr. Gillis pushed her closer. He did this on purpose, I knew it. He'd seen us here together and thought it'd be a good idea for my mother to talk to us. I hoped whatever he was planning, he turned out to be right. I'm feeling marvelous. The sun's shining for once, and the weather is warm. The flowers are still in bloom. In fact, they always seem to be in bloom, she said, her smile faltering. Almost as if by magic. She gripped the arms of the chair and really looked at us. Then she gasped and reached out a hand. Dion? She was out of that chair and in his arms in the blink of an eye. Dion embraced her, holding her close as he kissed her cheek. I'm sorry it's been so long since my last visit. I'm so sorry, love. It's all right. I know it can't be helped. My mother leaned back and looked at me. Finnick, you're here with your father. 
I hesitated, but then I went to her, unable to stay away. Yeah, I am. We've been talking. She hugged me so hard I couldn't breathe. I've been waiting for this day for a very long time. She cupped my cheek and Dion's. My guys, finally together again. I've missed you both so much. She leaned in to hug us, and I found myself sharing a family embrace that had me on the verge of crying myself. When I was little, this was all I dreamt about. As an adult, I told myself I didn't need Dion. But being there with him and my mother together told me how much of an idiot I was. As my mother finally let up on the hug, she glanced over my shoulder. Ah, and who is this beautiful young woman? I swiped at my eyes, then turned. This is Beckett. She's ah, she's my girlfriend. Beckett, I would like you to meet Flora. Beckett hurried around from the table and held out her hand for my mother's. She dragged Beckett into a hug. We hug in this family. I can't believe my son finally has a girlfriend. That's what this is, right? A real relationship? Not some fling. No, not a fling, Beckett replied through her laughter. Really? I mock scowled. What? I might not have much time and I would like to know as much as I can, especially how this happened, she said, pointing to Dion and me. You can thank your son, Dion told her. Finally called you out for hiding from him, huh? My mother went back to Dion and poked him in the chest. Good. I'm going to go check on something, Beckett said. Let you all catch up. It was nice meeting you, Flora. She gave me one more encouraging smile, then walked back toward the main building. Dr. Gillis remained outside, but gave us some space too. My mother and Dion were looking into each other's eyes, not saying a word. Had I not known better, I'd say there was nothing wrong with my mother. If only this moment could last. She took my hand, then Dion's and pulled us through the garden with her. Right, tell me everything as much as you can, she said eagerly. I don't know how long I have to soak it all in. Dion stopped walking. Flora gods, I'm sorry. Stop, my mother said sternly, but he kept shaking his head and muttering apologies. My mother let go of my hand and turned to Dion. You listen to me right now. You did not do this to me on purpose. What happened, happened. Right now, all I want to do is enjoy as much time as I can with you two. Dion wrapped her up in his arms and kissed the top of her head. I'll find a way to fix this. I swear to you, I will. My mother held on to him fiercely. Any lingering doubts that remained about how much they loved each other blew away with the wind. I locked gazes with Dion over my mother's head and told him without words I was on board for helping him save my mother in any way I could. He smiled appreciatively, and then my mother was pulling back. Now catch me up. Tell me about today. Tell me everything you can. I took the hand my mother offered, and together, the three of us walked through the gardens talking about anything and everything we could think of. Chapter 4 Beckett I stepped away from Finnick to give him much-needed time with his parents. That, and I hadn't wanted him to see me bawling my eyes out at their touching family reunion. They were together, and from the look of things, Finnick no longer wanted to kill his father. I'd take that as a win any day. Once I was back inside, I touched base with Rose. After receiving a very long-winded lecture about never scaring her like that again, she asked how everything else was going. I caught her up on my mother being on house arrest and ended with what I was pretty sure was Finnick professing his love. She'd gone so quiet I thought the call dropped, then she whooped and shouted until I had to pull the phone away from my ear and here I thought she hadn't liked him. I might not be in to work if you can spare me some time off, I told her once I reached the main lobby of the asylum. You take as much time as you need. Let me know if I can help, though. I might be calling in that favor soon. There's something I remembered reading in one of those other books, A Way to Cure Madness. I might need to pop into the shop and see what else you might have on the subject probably something useful in those old books. Anytime, dear, you have a key. 
Did I ever tell you you're the best person in the world? I said. She barked a laugh. Oh I know I am. Take care of yourself Beckett. Keep me posted and no more nearly dying. I'll do my best. I hung up and shoved my cell in my back pocket. I hadn't told her yet that I was planning on helping Finnick go after Karina to get his power back. Rose might act like a tough old lady, but her heart was fragile. Adding more stress to her plate right now was not my intention at all. I'd tell her about all that fun stuff afterward when it was just a story. I sat down on one of the benches near the front doors to wait for Finnick and Dion. I mulled over the notion of telling them both there was a slim chance I knew of a way to help Flora. Having hope was always good, but if I couldn't follow through it'd crush them. I hated to do that to them, after seeing them go through so much emotional turmoil. Hearing Dion talk about Flora, it wasn't hard to see he did love her. Then there was the fact that Finnick pretty much said he loved me. Just remembering what he told his father brought a grin to my face. A quiet huff came from behind the main desk. I glanced up to see Ellis, the one from earlier, shuffling through papers. Her lips were clamped shut, and she was glaring at the surface of her desk as if she was trying to set it on fire through sheer willpower. Her eyes flicked up then back down. She huffed again, louder this time, and mumbled something under her breath. Sorry? I asked. Was there something you wanted to say? Hum? Nothing. Why? I crossed my arms. Look, whatever you want to say to me about being with Finnick, just say it. We're both adults. She slammed a stack of files on the desk and gave me a bright, cheery, fake smile. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, you do, but whatever. Maybe ten seconds passed when she stood suddenly. Fine, I'll say it. I smirked and that just made her glare more. You won't last with him. No girl ever does. He'll dump you soon enough. I just want you to know that. You aren't good enough for him. Nice of you to make that judgment when you don't even know me. You're a witch. He never stays with witches long. Uses them as flings, nothing more. Right, and what were you to him? She lifted her chin into the air haughtily. I'll have you know he was with me the longest. So, you were his girlfriend? I asked, and knew the second I said it she hadn't been. She worked her jaw and glanced away. Because you know I am his girlfriend. Pretty sure I'm the only real girlfriend he's had. It's quite nice, him being my boyfriend and all. He's not, she shouted, and my eyes widened in amusement at her outburst. She looked around, but we were alone. He's not and he never will be. Okay, you keep telling yourself that. I'll be sure to send you an invite to the wedding. I was joking, since I honestly had no way to know if Finnick and I would last long enough to make it to a wedding. The look on Ellis's face was priceless though. Her jaw dropped and she looked like she'd been slapped. She was still wearing that same face, as Finnick and Dion entered the main lobby, talking quietly with the same man who'd brought Flora over. I assumed he was Dr. Gillis. Finnick smiled when he spotted me. Ellis let out an annoyed squeak. He frowned. I mouthed later and fought to keep from laughing. I must say you two together, I think does Flora good, Dr. Gillis was saying. This is the longest I've seen her lucid in years. You think our being together will cure the madness? Finnick asked. I wish I could say yes, but it's highly unlikely. I fear one day soon we will lose Flora. She won't be able to recall any details of her life. I wish I had better news, though I am glad to see you are alive and well, he said, giving Finnick a pointed glare. Dion tilted his head as he glanced at his son. Alive and well? Something going on I should know about? Long story but everything's fine, Finnick assured him. Really? I was just being cautious by leaving what was essentially a farewell letter to your mother. What? Dion snapped. Finnick's eyes narrowed. You and I just started kind of being a family, so save the fatherly lecture. We're not there. Not yet. Dion's lips thinned, but he didn't say anything else. We have a few things to catch up on, 
Finnick told him. You do, I said, unable to stop myself as I hurried forward. Dion, why don't you come back to my loft with us and you two can talk there. I took Finnick's hand and tilted my head, hoping he'd get the message that I had more to say, just not here. It wasn't that I didn't trust Dr. Gillis, but not every god or demi-healer approved of witch magic being brought in under their roof. I'd talk to Finnick about it first, then let him and Dion decide. I have time, Dion informed us. Lead the way. You sure about this? Finnick asked quietly as we headed for the door. Are you? He should know what Karina did to you. And I have other news. I want you both to hear it. His brow wrinkled. Other news. Trust me. Come on. I was going to ask if we would take a cab or use my magic. Instead, Dion merely asked for my address. He snapped his fingers, and I found myself standing outside the door to my loft. It took a second for me to remember I didn't have keys with me. Covering the lock with my palm, I thought of the incantation for unlocking locks. The lock warmed beneath my touch, then clicked open. Finnick chuckled. What are you laughing about? I turned around and sighed. You know the bubble thing didn't start happening till you came around. I think I'm okay with that. I led the way inside the loft, flipping on lights as I went. Frankie, we're back. I sense more than just you and the demi. Is that a god? The large snail on the kitchen island. Yes, it's a god. Be polite. This is Finnick's father, Dion. I grabbed the kettle off the stove and filled it with water to make some tea. Dion and Finnick entered together, with Dion glancing around a curious look on his face. This is more of a forest than a loft, he said with a smile. Makes me happy, and it's sort of become my specialty over the years. Tea for everyone? That's fine. Beckett, what were you not willing to say back at the asylum? Finnick asked. I set the kettle on the stove and turned the burner on high. Frankie moved closer to me, his eyes shifting around to look at Finnick and his father, then back to me. I ignored him for the moment and cleared my throat. Right, when we were going through all those books trying to find a way to lift my binding and break your curse, I stumbled across something that might help Flora. What? Finnick was almost shouting. Why didn't you say something earlier? She said might, Dion said. She isn't certain, and probably didn't want to get our hopes up. I still don't because I'm not even sure if it'll work. I need to find the passage again and read up on it. That, and I wasn't sure what Dr. Gillis's position was on outside help. Depending on what it is, I don't see him turning down your help, Dion said. Great, then while I go searching through books, you two can sit down and Finnick can catch you up on the last few weeks. I beamed at my new boyfriend and wondered if he was regretting being with me yet. He scowled, but then he smiled and guided Dion to the small kitchen table. With the two of them sitting there, it appeared a hell of a lot smaller. In fact my whole loft seemed tinier. I went to find the books I'd been looking through so frantically the last few weeks while Finnick delved into the story of how he met me. As he talked about Karina cursing him in the park and how she turned him into a jackass, Dion burst out laughing. The sound boomed through the loft, and I cringed until Finnick joined in. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Then Beckett accidentally transformed me into a mouse the first night we met. And also turned me pink. With purple spots, was it? Hey, to be fair, my magic was still bound, I said without looking up from the book in my lap. Their voices carried on behind me as I searched through one book after another. The kettle whistled, and Finnick got tea for them, leaving me to my search. I was sure I'd marked the page, but in the chaos that transpired the last few nights, there was a chance it had become unmarked. Frankie joined me on the floor. He sounds like his father, he said quietly. He does. Looks like him too. Their laughter reached me again. I'm not sure how long this will last between them, but I'm going to take credit for some of it at least. I'm glad, Frankie said sincerely. I'm pleased you're happy. Really. He's a good one. I rested my hand on Frankie's shell. Thanks. I really like him. 
and if you decide you don't, you can always turn him into a mouse again now that you have your magic back. I picked up the next book. Halfway through it, Finnick reached the part in his story where Karina made him kiss her to break the curse. I sensed eyes on me and realized both men were watching me. Yes? I said slowly. Nothing. Still amazed you didn't get pissed at me for kissing her. You're still an idiot for going to meet her without sufficient backup, I muttered. So she kissed you and lifted the curse? I don't see what the issue is, Dion said, confused. Oh you will, I said. What? He's not going to be happy about it. I'm not happy about it. I still hold the right to call you a moron over what happened, as grateful as I am to not have my magic bound permanently. Dion's confusion seemed to grow at my comment. Separate story. Get on with it, I told Finnick. I thought Karina lifted the curse. I was able to use my power. I broke the binding that had been on Beckett's magic since she was born, but right after she stole it. Dion tapped his fingers on the tabletop, then suddenly stopped. She stole your power. Sucked it right into some creepy eyeball amulet she wore, he explained. I'm mortal now. Dion sipped his tea then pushed the mug aside. Would it surprise you both to hear you're not the first Demi who has lost his power recently? Finnick and I exchanged a glance then he said, yeah it would. Because of Karina? Yes her. Plus some other witches in her coven. We've been keeping a close eye on their activities. Yours are the tenth set of powers stolen however, and I believe the time has come for someone to do something about it. I flipped over the book I'd been reading through to hold my page, and stood. Someone? I'm afraid that gods, as you know, are not allowed, technically speaking, to intervene in the workings of witches. Only your goddess has that authority. However, and no offense intended at all, he said with a nod to me, your goddess has not exactly been a part of this world in the last two centuries. She believes in a hands-off approach, which quite frankly drives the rest of us a bit crazy. I wasn't offended at all. The majority of witches understood our goddess was out of touch with reality. The last witch to speak with her directly had died fifty years ago. Before then, it was a rarity for the goddess to show herself to anyone, let alone reach out to her people. Now she was more of a figurehead than someone we prayed to. In all honesty, we didn't necessarily need her. Our magic originated from her, but she wasn't what kept it going. But that would get into an entire history lesson in magic that Dion already knew and that Finnick didn't need to hear. We know, trust me, I said. But witches stealing the powers of Demis seems like a reason for you to intervene. That coven has always been borderline evil, and I'm pretty sure wearing human eyeballs and amulets and snatching powers could be announcing their intentions are not good. For anyone. At all. Dion gave me an amused smile, then winked at Finnick. I understand why you like her. My advice. Don't let this one go. Didn't he tell you about the part where he risked his life to save me? I think he left that part out. Happened afterward, Finnick said with a wave, dismissing the matter. You're saying you can't do anything about Karina's coven, but you do want something done, is that it? That would be it, exactly. There are some who will help me when I call for it, but not many. They don't like to meddle if they can help it, at least not in affairs such as these, he amended as Finnick and I raised a brow. Once you're ready to make your move against them, use this to summon me. I'll bring whatever help I can. But your gods, I insisted as Dion removed a gold coin from his pocket and handed it to Finnick. Can't you snap your fingers and just take away their magic? You and I both know that's not the case. A girl can hope. Dion stood and thanked me for the tea. I would like to hear the rest of this story about you and your magic having been bound, but I'm afraid it will have to wait. I must be returning. He held out his hand and Finnick took it. I'm sorry it's taken so long for us to talk. I would like to do it again. Me too, Finnick said. And ah, uh, about Flora, let me know the next time you go see her. I'll join you. I'd like that. Dion turned to me. Beckett, it was a pleasure. 
You too. As soon as I find anything that might help Flora, I'll let you know. No promises. I understand, but it's good to have even a tiny glimmer of hope. He glanced behind me and nodded to Frankie. It seemed odd to me that a god should even care that much about my familiar, but I wasn't one to try and understand them. We always assumed our familiars were, in some way, an extension of the goddess. Perhaps they were extensions of the other gods sent to keep an eye on us and guide us when our goddess failed to do so. I wanted to ask, but didn't have a chance because Dion snapped his fingers and was gone. Well, that was certainly an eventful day. I kissed Finnick's cheek. I'm glad you were with me. Not sure I would have made it through that conversation without you there. I do my best. Now I'm going to return to my search. Finnick joined me on the floor near the stacks of books. It only took me another half hour to finally find the page I'd been on. I let out an excited yelp that made Finnick jump, and Frankie jerk harshly to the side since he was too sticky to leap off the floorboards. I apologized as I flipped the book around and dropped it in Finnick's lap. There. Right there. A rose that can cure madness, Finnick murmured. Looks like it could work. Hey Beckett, it says it's extinct. No one's seen this rose in centuries. When was this book written? Not sure but I think I can bring it back. How? Magic. Very old, very strong magic. I grabbed a pad of paper and pen, to begin working out the rest of what was in the pages. Finnick grabbed my hand. He tugged me right down into him, shoving the book aside. Will this be dangerous? I tilted my head. Define dangerous. Beckett. What? It's no more dangerous than going after Karina. That is what you should really be worried about. Going after her won't be easy. I'm fairly certain we won't get your power back without a fight. I tried to stand but he wrapped his arms around me. Hey, right now, you're the one with no power. I get to protect you for a bit. You're going to drive me crazy on purpose. I see nothing wrong with that. I'm thinking bubbles. Everywhere. He leaned forward and brushed his lips against mine. I can live with the bubbles. Pretty sure I can't live without you. His words made the temperature in the room rise. We had to get some research done, and I assumed Frankie was perched somewhere close by with an unapproving look on his face. As we paused long enough to catch our breath, a quick look around said I was wrong. My familiar was nowhere in sight. Huh. What? Finnick asked, nuzzling my neck until I started laughing. Frankie must really like you, after all. He's not even here. Finnick looked around. Glad I made a good impression. Saving me and standing up to Harriet might have something to do with that. I grabbed his shoulders and kissed him, then finally managed to untangle myself from his arms. He grunted, annoyed. I hauled him up with me. Work first. I want to find out if this rose thing is even possible. Hate to think I'm getting yours and Dion's hopes up just so I can fail. Again. He pressed his lips to my forehead and hugged me. You're not a failure. You never were. Just something I grew accustomed to. Well you're not, so time to move on. You are a witch, a damn strong witch who on occasion creates bubbles. I glanced up to catch him smiling. That's all your fault. I think I can handle taking the blame for it. The clock said it was only half past three. Rose would be in the shop, puttering around. I had more books to find on the topic of this extinct rose, as well as to figure out how to bring it back to life. Or at least, a version of it. I told Finnick to grab the book with the rose, then hurry to get my notebook and a working pen. Nothing worse than having a pen die on me during research. I took a quick scan of the books, tugged some off the shelves and quickly flipped to sections that might be of help. Once that was done, I grabbed Finnick and headed for the front door. Where are we going? I don't have everything I need here. We're off to the bookstore. I hope you're up for a long night of reading. Someone nudged my foot and I jerked in the armchair. Rose stood over me, holding out a steaming mug. I took it with a smile, and breathed in the hot cider. 
she sank into the armchair beside me. He's been out for a while. A few hours. Guess I passed out too. I yawned and rubbed a hand down my face to try and wake up. Finnick's quiet snores filled the back room of Rose's bookstore. Night had fallen hours ago. I expected her to be in bed by now, but here she was looking wide awake and ready to go. What's going on with you? What? I can't come downstairs to check on you too. You've been at it for hours. You seem excited. She sipped from her mug of cider. I'm an old woman. Anything even remotely different from my everyday routine is like a new adventure to me. And this one certainly sounds intriguing if nothing else. Dangerous too. Something Phoenix has been keen to point out several times already. He did just get you back. I think he's allowed to be worried if you're going to decide to do something reckless. I studied Phoenix's sleeping face. There was a slight curl to his lips, and I wondered what he was dreaming about. I'm not reckless, I told her. Rarely reckless. Confronting your mother was reckless. She rested her wrinkled hand on mine, and when I met her eyes I saw shimmering tears. You can't scare me like that again. Finnick called and said you look like you were dead. I never had a family, until you walked through that shop door and gave me one. Promise me you'll be careful? My old heart can't take too much these days. I laid my hand on her arm. I swear to you I'll be careful. I'm sorry I scared you. She dabbed at her eyes with a tissue and sniffed loudly. Yes well, you should be quite proud of yourself. Nothing scares me these days. I just can't believe what she did to you. She attacked you just like that. And it was all for nothing. At some point, I'd have to speak with my mother and try to understand where we stood. And my father. I hadn't even seen him. He'd called a few times, but as far as I knew, he made no attempt to visit me while I was at the coven house. So much for his being on my side in these matters. That was not a conversation I was looking forward to having with either of them. Eventually, I'd have to come to terms that I was going to have a sister or brother. Marie and the elders had best keep an eye on the baby my mother delivered, so she didn't bind its powers. Never in the history of our coven had a baby been separated from its parents. In this case, it might be for the best. My mother couldn't be allowed to raise another child the way she raised me. Beckett? You okay? Yeah, I'm just rethinking every day of my entire life. I ran my fingers slowly around the rim of the mug as I stared into space. A month ago, I never would have imagined this is where I'd be right now. Full range of my magic, my mother under house arrest. Oh, and I have a boyfriend. That's crazy. How did all this happen? I have to pinch myself constantly because a very tiny part of me keeps saying this is all inside my head. None of it's real. I'll wake up tomorrow and Finnick will be gone. My mother will still be driving me crazy and the elders will have bound my magic permanently. I took a long drink, letting it warm my stomach, then set the mug aside. I think part of me is still in shock. This is not the life I expected to have. Are you saying you don't want it? Because I have no shame in saying that attractive young lad over there would possibly turn me into a cougar. I had to cover my mouth to muffle my laughter as Rose did the same. You're terrible. Yes I am and proud of it. She leaned over so our shoulders touched. Not for the first time, I wished Rose had been my mother instead of Harriet. You seem happier though, despite everything you've been through lately. There's a light in your eyes that wasn't there before. I am. Happy I mean. I'll be better if I can save Flora and stop Karina from using Phoenix's power for evil. I'm sure you'll be able to do both. This old bag of bones is going to head upstairs to bed. Night Rose and thanks. You know, for everything. She smiled then bent over and kissed the top of my head. Of course. Any time. She walked up the ramp through the shop. A couple of seconds later, I heard the creaking and groaning of the old wooden stairs as she climbed them to her second floor apartment. I drank some more of the cider, then went back to my reading. 
The text was tiny in all these damned books, and some of it was written in a mix of languages. I tossed another useless book aside, yawned, and dragged over another stack. It was getting late, or rather early, when I flipped to a page in an old text. The pages were dried out and crumbling at the edges. I was almost too nervous to keep reading it, but the second I flipped over the next page, I froze. Carefully, I read over the spell and how it worked. Marking the page, I scrambled to snag the three other books that had more bits to the puzzle in them and laid them all together in front of me. They all dealt with different ways to recreate something that was lost. I'd been worried about trying to do it with something organic. Some years ago, a stupid witch had no doubt thought this was a great spell to use in place of necromancy, a dark art that was banned. I took my time, even as my heart began to race. Each time I worked through the plan in my head, the pieces all fell into place. I can recreate the rose, I whispered, excited. I reached over and slapped Finnick's leg. Hey, wake up. I found it. Huh? What? Finnick mumbled as he sat up from the bed he'd made out on the floor, from throw pillows and a blanket. Beckett? I found it. You did? Eyes wide, he scooted over to me. I pointed at the various pages. You're going to have to help me out here. All looks like gibberish to me. I know. I'll explain it all to you later, but I have a place to start. How long will it take? he asked eagerly. A few weeks to grow the rose, possibly longer. It might not work the first time. I need you to understand that. This could end up taking months or a year. It depends on how well I can work my magic. I worried my bottom lip. The different ways I could fail this spell sprang to mind. I rambled them off without thinking. My fear that this magic was beyond me almost consumed me until Finnick kissed me. You're really good at that, you know. I murmured against his lips. Not so bad yourself. We looked at the open books and he sighed. We'll worry about the rose after we deal with Karina. You sure? I can get that started since the rose will take time, I said. He kissed me again. Breathless, I laughed. All right, you win. We'll worry about the rose if we manage not to get ourselves in any more trouble. You're not making me feel better. I'm being a realist, I explained as I shifted around. Using his arm as a pillow, I laid down beside him on the floor. Karina's strong. She's had a few more years than I have to hone her magic. That's why we're doing this together. Finnick. No, I'm serious. You're not doing anything involving her, unless I'm there with you. And Garth. He still has his power at least. You're not going to let this go, are you? He hugged me to his side as he said, I thought I was going to lose you without getting a chance to tell you that I was sorry. And that I'm pretty damn sure I'm falling in love with you. What do you think? I hugged him back as I whispered, falling in love with you too. Good, glad to hear I'm not alone in this craziness. Nope, not even close. I lifted my head so I could stare into his eyes. I don't want you getting hurt just as much as you don't want me in the line of fire. If we do this together, then you have to listen to me and do exactly as I say. Chapter 5 Finnick This is a terrible idea. You know if you say it a few more times, it might sink in, Beckett said with a wink from across the living room. I tapped my finger on the spell book and repeated, this time louder, terrible idea. I don't think we heard you, Garth chimed in. You two knowing each other is no longer a good idea. Will you quit worrying? I told you this would be dangerous. Beckett shoved the couch out of the way. Or tried to. I sighed and went to help her. We pushed it against the far wall as Garth did the same with the coffee table and chair. Once space was cleared, Beckett and I rolled up the dark green area rug that always made me think of moss and rested it atop the couch. And I'm glad you told me, so I can rightly be concerned that my girlfriend is going to. What did you say was the worst case scenario? Oh, that's right. I held up my hand. Having your mind permanently melded with Karina's. Beckett grimaced. 
I hung my head. That wasn't the worst, was it? Nope, but we're not going to go there. Yeah, we are. Just tell me. Beckett bounced on the balls of her feet, then darted around me. I think it's better if you just don't think about it. The spell is going to go off without a hitch, and I'll be fine. Gods, she was a terrible liar. For the last three days, we'd been working on a plan to get close to Karina. To find out what her coven wanted with Demi Power. Sneaking onto the grounds outside their coven house sounded like a horrible idea. We'd be heavily outnumbered and outpowered. I needed to get back my abilities before we went anywhere near them. Then Beckett had suggested she spy on them. When I'd asked how, she had not looked happy about giving me the details. We'd argued about it all day yesterday. I called Garth over in hopes he'd talk her out of it, but the damn Demi sided with her. I tilted my head, studying Beckett at her work table. Her lips moved as she ran through the spell again. I took my time, enjoying every detail of her in those leather pants. She really needed to stop wearing them. All they did was distract me, and right then, I was trying to stay strong and find a different plan. Only I didn't have one. The spell she wanted to use would give us our best shot at some insight, but in my opinion, the risks far outweighed the benefits. Her hair fell out of the bun and covered her face. She blew at the strands, but didn't shove them out of the way. I couldn't help myself, and joined her at the table. I tucked her hair behind her ears then turned her to face me. What's the worst that can happen? I asked again. I deserve to know. She seemed to be struggling for words, bouncing on her feet, her eyes dancing around the loft. Then she held up her hands and made an exploding motion, complete with sound effects. I wasn't sure I understood, and she did it again, only louder. What would blow up? Her face scrunched as she mumbled me. I heard that loud and clear. You might blow up. Are you kidding me? What the hell is wrong with you? I ranted. We're not doing this. We're not. Pack it up, we'll figure something else out, but we are not doing this. You hear me? Finnick, just hang on a second, Beckett started. I was already moving to the area she cleared, and was ready to cover it right back up with a rug. Hey, look at me. Reluctantly, I spun around and scowled. She planted her hands on her hips and held my stare hotly. What? You can't stand there and tell me this is a good idea. You might blow up. Beckett, I know we need to see what's happening with her coven, but this is too far. The chances of that happening are less than 1%. That's still too damned high. I won't risk your life for my power. Yeah. And what about what I'm willing to do? You lost it because of me, remember? This is how we get it back. This is how we help Dion and the gods. She came closer, but kept a couple of feet between us. I'm doing this with or without your help. Jaw clenched, I shifted my glare to Garth. You knew. He shrugged. Sorry, man, but she's got a point. Besides, there's a high probability Karina won't even know Beckett's inside her mind. She'll cast the spell, get what info she can, then get out. Easy. Nothing will go wrong, Beckett added sternly. Or do you still not think my magic's good enough? That has nothing to do with it. Which means it does. She scoffed and crossed her arms. Seriously? I'm just saying, you've only just gotten the use of your magic back. Are you sure you want to try this complicated of a spell? She laughed, but it was far from happy. Well, just wow. Really? What? It's a legitimate worry. That I'm not good enough. All this time you told me that I was a damned good witch, were you just saying that to make me feel better? Is this because I got blasted into that alternate reality? I hesitated, and the second I did, I knew I'd made a mistake. I could see it on her face. Beckett. No, just, I need a minute. She stormed toward the front door. I hurried to catch her hand. She yanked it away from me. I said, I need a minute. My chest became uncomfortable, heavy. 
All I'm trying to say is I should be the one taking this risk, I insisted. Not you. And so what if I'm worried about you? After what I had to save you from, how do you expect me not to be? My knight in shining armor, she muttered sarcastically. I did you a favor, and I did it without my power, I pointed out. I've been living with no power for days now, watching you use magic and not saying a damned word. It's me who should be going after Karina, but instead it has to be you, and I don't like it. Because you think I'm going to fail, she snapped. I'm freaking worried all the time that something is going to happen to you. That I'm going to lose you because I'm nothing right now. Nothing but a damned mortal since I risked everything to save your magic. Magic that for all we know might still be unstable. Not like you've been using it for more than what, a couple of days now. I ran my hands through my hair as I stomped away from her. When I turned back, her face was dangerously blank and my heart sank. Shit. What the hell had I just said? Beckett, I said slowly and reached for her. She stepped back. Her stoic face shattered into one of anger. I've been a witch all my life, she said quietly, her voice shaking. All of my life. I've studied and practiced. I know how to use magic. I might not be as experienced as I'd like to be at this point, but I saved you, didn't I? Karina lifted the curse, I said, then bit my tongue. But the magic you did before then was incredible, even with it being bound. Just stop. She turned for the door, then paused. You know for a second there, I thought you weren't like the other Demis. You're just the same as them. Arrogant and condescending. Do you want to get your own power back? Fine. Have fun facing down Karina as a mortal. Wait please. What for? So you can give me another reminder of how you lost everything to save me. She opened the door and slammed it shut behind her. A whistle came from behind me. What is wrong with you tonight? Garth asked. I hadn't meant it to come out like that, I said lamely. No. And how did you want those insults to sound? Damn Finnick, you really shoved your foot in it this time. No shit. What had I just done? I knew Beckett was a more than capable witch, but every time she used magic, a huge part of me feared she ended up in some place worse than that gray, dreary world. Or she'd get hurt. Or she'd blow up, since apparently that was a possibility. I worried about her safety so damn much it made my chest ache and my palms sweat. Gods, I can't even think straight right now. You know she's doing this for you, he pointed out. All of this is for you. I know. Just like you risked yourself for her, he went on. I grunted in aggravation. I know, all right. I get it, but she's the only woman I've ever fallen in love with. Am I not allowed to be a bit when she's using such dangerous magic? She's a witch. This is her calling. Using magic is what she's meant to do. I think she'd rather you have faith in her abilities and her intelligence to not try something she's not sure about. Garth clapped me on the back then shoved me toward the front door. And you better go after her right now, before she decides to turn you into something worse than a jackass for the rest of your life. When I didn't move, another shove came from a shadow at my feet. Beckett's shadow. It crossed its arms impatiently and kicked at my feet. If that wasn't enough, a massive fuzzy tarantula suddenly falling onto my head had me rushing to the door. Damn it, Frankie. I yelled, until the familiar leapt from my head to the nearby doorframe. Go after her, you idiot, the spider ordered. Or I'll be biting you in a not-so-pleasant place. I opened the door. Garth gave me a push out, then closed it behind me. I looked up and down the hall and almost went to the elevator, but I realized Beckett wouldn't have left the building. There was only one place she liked to go when she was upset. I turned to the left and aimed for the door that led to the roof. The metal stairs vibrated beneath my feet as I ran up them and opened the heavy steel door. A light rain was falling, a very cold light rain. My breath puffed in front of my face as I slowly walked away from the door, searching for Beckett. She stood at the ledge, hands resting on the stone and her back ramrod straight. 
I could barely hear her angry mutterings over the rain and the muted rumble of thunder in the distance. I walked to the ledge and didn't have to look at Beckett to know I was being glared at. Rain pattered the roof around us, soaking my head and clothes, not that I cared. I'd stay out here all night with her if that's what it took. I'm sorry, I said. Yeah, sure you are. Don't do that. I'm not your mom. When I say I'm sorry, I mean it. I know you can do magic, great magic, but you have no idea what's going on inside my head right now. Then enlighten me, she snapped. What makes you think something will go wrong? Because I'm happy. She huffed. I took hold of her hand and turned her to face me. The rain came down harder, running down my face, but I kept looking in those stormy grayish-green eyes with just a hint of her magic glowing in their depths. I haven't had much of that, mostly because I've never let myself have it. I was too worried it'd blow up in my face, just like I'm worried now that if I give in and admit how much I care for you, something will go wrong. She studied me, nose scrunched, lips pursed to the side. You're one of the smartest women I've ever met. Shit, look at everything you've accomplished without magic. Now that you have it, you're going to do incredible things, momentous things. I searched her face for any sign she was going to suddenly haul off and hit me, but caught the hint of a smile instead. When I spotted the shimmering blue and violet bubbles within the drops of rain, I knew she'd forgiven me. I can't lose you, so yeah, I'm terrified of your performing any spell that has a tiny chance of backfiring. And for the record, I do not blame you for my losing my power. I know, she sighed. But you can't let fear get the better of you. I'll be fine. Can't help it. Usually, I'd be a little helpful, but all I can do now is stand on the sidelines. You do a hell of a lot more than that, she argued. I've got this, Finnick. I've got you. Karina is just another witch. A dark witch who doesn't have the same morals that you do. She stood on her toes and kissed me in the rain. Just because I don't use blood magic or steal powers from Demis doesn't mean I can't kick some ass now and again. You just haven't seen me on a bad day. You pissed off. Never. She laughed as I wrapped her in my arms and kissed her. My fingers grew tangled in her wet hair, and we quickly made our way to the stairwell. Once inside it, she shoved me against the wall and told me with a kiss that despite my harshness earlier she was still mine, and I was still hers. I had no idea what was going to happen tonight or any night after, but we were in this together. Fear was just another obstacle I had to overcome. Beckett was strong and she needed my support. If that was all I could do for her right then, that's what I'd do. Back inside the loft a good twenty minutes later, we quickly changed into dry clothes and went back to work of setting up for the mind meld spell. I wasn't sure what it was called, but it sounded good in my head. Beckett finished drawing the symbols in chalk on the floor. Next came bundles of herbs and other dried plants. She'd probably told me what they were, but I'd forgotten. Garth stood a few feet away. When he caught my eye, he gave me an encouraging smile that did little to make me feel better. That should do it, Beckett said, as she stood inside the large triangle on the floor. A smaller one overlapped the first and had a bowl of black powder inside it. Book if you please, and the matches too. Walk me through this one more time. I held out the spell book open to the correct page along with the matches. Finnick. I'm not panicking. I just want to make sure I understand completely. She sighed as she sat cross-legged with the book before her. The matches she kept in her right hand, ready and waiting. After I recite the spell, I'll light the powder, she pointed to the bowl inside the smaller triangle, and I'll go into a sort of trance. If it works correctly, I'll be connected to Karina's mind. I'll be able to see and hear what she does. And there's a chance she'll sense your presence. Beckett waited for a few beats, then nodded. Yeah. And she can knock you out of her head. She can, but that won't cause me to blow up. That happened if everything that could go wrong did go wrong. You keep the notepad handy. I'll relay what I can, but no guarantees it'll make sense. Sort of be like transcribing mad ramblings. 
I smiled as I sat down just outside the triangle. Good thing I'm fluent in your mad ramblings then. She returned the grin, then cleared her throat. Frankie, get the lights, please. The snail climbed his way up the wall and pressed himself onto the light switch. The loft went dark, save for the glow of several luminescent moonflowers vining up the walls. Finnick, you ready? Beckett asked. Garth settled down beside me, and Frankie appeared between us a second later. I readied the pen on the notepad. Ready. Great, here's to not blowing myself up. Beckett, seriously? I muttered. I heard her quiet laughter. Then she fell silent. Not a sound came from the loft until Beckett recited the spell. With each whispered word, a new symbol on the floor pulsed with life until they were all lit. The glow cast shadows across Beckett's face. I couldn't tell if her eyes were open or closed at this point. She struck a match and tossed it into the black powder. It burned immediately, and Beckett's head fell forward as she sucked in a sharp breath. She told me this would happen, but I was halfway to my feet anyway. Garth grabbed my arm at the last second, stopping me from charging into the triangle. Get ready to write, he told me as I sat back down. She's fine. Nothing's gone wrong yet. It's the yet part that makes me worry. Seconds turned to minutes, and Beckett said nothing. She didn't move. For a horrible second, I couldn't tell if she was breathing. Finally, she lifted her head, eyes closed, and mumbled with her. She hadn't said if we should ask questions or not, so I kept the pen ready and waiting. Her brow wrinkled, and her hands twitched against her knees. Witches, a lot of witches. Bad, all of them bad, she whispered. They've all got those creepy eyeball pendants. Goddess, that's just wrong. She turned her head and tilted it as if straining to hear. They're talking about the gods, all the gods, something about more power. Tracking Demis in the city, no, not just the city, in the state. Shit, this is bad. I jotted down the notes as quickly as I could, but she needed to find something that could help us. See their plans. As if reading my mind, she held up her hand and said to wait a second. One of the elders for the Blood Moon Coven had just entered the room. Something about getting strong enough. No wait. Gaining enough power to attack. They want the gods. They want all the gods. Holy shit, she whispered. Then she said nothing for a really long time. I hated to do it, but my worry for her getting trapped in Karina's mind overrode everything else. Beckett, what do you see? A portal. They're building a portal at the Coven House. Just started laying foundations, working on the magic, but they need more. A lot more. Going after Demis, all the Demis. Early, it's too early. She has your power around her neck still. There's more. So many more than ten. Shit. Beckett. She cringed, and then a voice that was not Beckett's flowed out of her mouth. Spying on me, eh? Karina said, then let out a dark cackle. You'll regret this, witch. A loud clap like thunder hurt my ears, and there was a bright flash of light. Beckett screamed, then everything went deathly silent. I squinted, attempting to make out anything, but the bright flash of light messed with my eyes. Frankie, grab the lights, I said, setting the notepad aside and reaching for the triangle. Beckett. The lights came on, and I cursed. Plus Beckett laid in the triangle, not moving with steam rising off her body. I rushed for her and rolled her to her back. She wasn't breathing. When I checked for a pulse, it was there but faint. Beckett. Wake up, damn it. I lifted her into my lap and tapped her cheek. Beckett. Her eyes shot open. She gasped as she nearly butted me right in the forehead. Finnick? Right here. Take a breath. I held her close as she breathed in deeply, then let it out. Her head fell back. I thought she passed out again. Her body shook. I lifted her up, and I found she was laughing. What the hell is so funny? Ah, you should have seen the look on Karina's face when she realized I was there. She laughed even harder, and I set her back on the floor. What? Oh, come on, you'd be laughing too. How did you see her face? 
Garth asked as I stalked toward the kitchen to grab us all some beers. You were in her head, right? Beckett sat up, still grinning madly. There was a mirror. The way her eyes bugged out, and the immense panic in those few seconds. Priceless. She thought she was such a powerful witch. I think she just met her match. I opened one of the beers and chugged it. I'm assuming you're fine then. Yep, perfectly fine, so you can relax. Have another beer might help calm your nerves and get rid of that furrow on your brow, she teased. This is it. This is what it feels like to have someone drive you crazy, I mumbled to myself as I opened another beer. She joined me at the counter and wrapped her arms around my middle, pressing her face to my back. I kissed her forehead. I wrote down everything you said, but some of it might not make sense. Did you get a good look at these plans of theirs? For the portal, you mean? Kind of, but Karina's not part of that plan. She's in the part of collecting powers from Demis. We have to stop them. This portal sounds like it will be able to break into the realm of the gods. Garth walked over. I handed him a beer, and after Beckett shot me a look, she grabbed one for herself out of the fridge. Need to let Dion know, Garth said. And we need to get your power back. We need to stop them. Any ideas? I asked Beckett. Preferably, none that might end up with you blowing up. One. It's dangerous before you ask, but no, I don't think I'll self-combust. My beer was halfway to my mouth when I paused at her tone. What could happen then? How about we save that for tomorrow? I'm starving. Anyone else hungry? I could eat, Garth told her. I said the same, and watched as she scooped up her cell and hurried upstairs to order takeout. Her voice trailed down to us over the railing, but we were out of sight. I finally let my shoulders slump and hung my head. She made it, and we have some good intel. Garth was clearly trying to make me feel more comfortable about what we were up to. Yeah. And what about what she's planning next? I'm not sure how many more times I can watch that woman collapse. Garth gave me a sympathetic smile. She can handle herself. Drink your beer and try to relax for a little while. If that portal is real, we're just getting into the thick of this mess. You have to be ready for a fight, my friend. That was just it. If there was going to be a showdown between the witches of the Blood Moon Coven and the gods, I didn't want Beckett anywhere near it. Too bad that wasn't going to happen. Chapter 6 Beckett I came downstairs, yawning and stretching my arms over my head. Is that bacon? Phoenix stood at the stove, Frankie perched on the Demi's shoulder like they were best friends. Bacon waffles some fried eggs. I wasn't sure what you'd want, but you need to eat. We both do. He smiled at me over his shoulder. The one Frankie wasn't occupying. Tonight's a big night. Don't remind me. I sat down in one of the high stools near the island. Garth's still coming, right? He is. You sure you don't want anyone from the coven here? Just in case? I'm sure. If this does go sideways, I won't put anyone else at risk. You're lucky I'm letting you stay here, I added quietly. Heard that and no, I'm not leaving. I scrunched my face at him, annoyed. He placed bacon, eggs, and a waffle on a plate and slid it toward me along with a cup of coffee. I smothered it all in butter and syrup, then dug in. Last night had been rough, melding with Karina's mind. Tonight was going to be even harder. My plan was simple, but I wasn't an idiot. Karina would be waiting for us to make a move. The easiest way to try and bring back Finnick's power was for me to summon it. In doing so, however, there was a high chance Karina would hijack the spell, and she'd come right along with it. I glanced around my loft. There were about twenty more wards I needed to draw on the walls, as well as a few other traps near the windows and door. If she did come here, she wasn't going to get out easily. I had a few magical tricks up my sleeves too. There was a whole arsenal of spells I'd learned about ten years ago I never thought I'd use. Now was the time to dust them off and see if I could remember how to kick ass. Frankie? 
Can you pop upstairs and see if the crystals I have soaking in the sink are ready? You're welcome by the way, for reminding you of that trick, Frankie said, then disappeared from Finnick's shoulder. Thanks. I yelled toward upstairs. The crystals I was using as part of the wards were water-based. They worked better if they could soak for a good 10 hours in water, mixed with several other ingredients that were not easy to come by. Well, not easy if you weren't a herbologist. You'd make me feel better if you got that expression off your face. I paused mid-chew. What expression? I said around a mouthful of waffle. Finnick laughed, then dug into his plate, staying on the other side of the counter. The expression that says you're looking for a fight. Not looking just ready for one. His brow arched. I shrugged. Can't a girl be a little excited to use combat spells she's never had a chance to bust out before? When he still didn't seem convinced, I washed down my food with a gulp of coffee then sidled around the island. Finnick watched me out of the corner of his eye. Kicking Karina's ass from here to next year will be awesome, especially if I'm wearing my leather pants. Maybe that black sweater you seem to love so much? Or I could also go with something a little different. Like what? he asked gruffly. I shrugged. I dunno. Something like this. My hand glowed violet as I pictured a very different outfit. I dragged my hand down my front. My clothing shifted and changed. Finnick's eyes narrowed and he dropped his fork. How about this? I winked at Finnick. The blood red blouse I wore was overlaid with black stitching and a black leather corset. The back of the blouse was longer than the front with ruffle. My hair was braided back with a fine silver ribbon. My boots were high-heeled and laced all the way up to my thighs, covering black leather pants with red stripes running down the sides. You really want me distracted, don't you? He murmured as he snaked an arm around my waist and nuzzled my neck. If it stops your freaking out. Not freaking out. Worrying. I'm allowed to worry. He left a trail of kisses from my neck along my jaw to my cheek, and finally my lips. You are, I replied, but still my job to keep you safe. Remember? You keep wearing outfits like this, and you could probably tell me to do just about anything. So, you'll stay away tonight, and let me and Garth handle it. Finnick took hold of my hips and firmly set me away from him. No. Damn. He sighed and went back to eating his breakfast. Nice try though. I ran my hand over my clothing again, and went back to the black yoga pants and dark blue hoodie I'd fallen asleep in. His brow twitched as I walked away and I shook my head. It was nice that he could like my wearing something as simple as this. I plopped onto my stool and sulked all through breakfast. If we made it through this mess, I'd have to work on my temptation skills. Now that I had my magic back, I had a feeling I was about to find myself in all sorts of situations that might be deemed dangerous by Finnick. After breakfast, we went to work on the wards and the traps. Finnick turned out to be an extremely helpful assistant, albeit a bit better at causing distraction than I was. His hands kept finding ways to be at my hips or running through my hair. More than once, we were interrupted by a very loud snail. We'd laugh and break apart only to have my familiar land on one of our shoulders and remind us quite loudly we were taking on an evil witch tonight. I cringed each time he said it. Frankie, she might not even show up, I reminded him for the fifth time as the sun was going down. Maybe we'll get lucky. She'll show. You know she will. How could she not? He had a point. Karina had a reputation for being undefeated. She wouldn't let a good witch like me take back Finnick's power without a fight. The spell was strong enough to summon his power, that much I was sure of. I was supercharging it with the help of several concoctions of my own making, stemming from some very unique flowers I'd been cultivating over the years. The power boost wouldn't last forever, but long enough to show Karina that she should never have messed with Finnick or me. I placed the final ward then moved onto the traps. A knock came at the door, and Finnick went to answer it. Garth had arrived. I waved at him, but was too busy reciting a spell for one of the traps to say anything. These would take the longest to set. 
I moved from window to window, then finally to the front door. I sank to my knees and lowered my hand to the hard floor. Lines as if I was drawing them onto the floor, stretched out from my palm and formed three intersecting pentagrams. Surrounding them were more sigils and runes written in the old language. Once the trap was set, it burned into the floor then disappeared. It would only appear again if it was triggered. There. Traps are set and so are the wards. I think we're ready for a show, gents. Has she been this cheery all day? Garth asked. Phoenix scowled at me. What do you think? You going to possibly fight against Karina in yoga pants? I like to be comfortable, if I'm going to be running all over the place. Now, I said, ignoring his aggravated grunt. The wards on the windows will help diminish her power. She won't be able to set the place on fire or use any blood magic. The traps will prevent her from escaping once she's here. You're just going to what? Nicely ask for my power back? Finnick crossed his arms. I will, but do you think she's just going to hand it over? I shook out my hands then moved to the center of the loft. My shadow stayed right at my feet as extra defense. Frankie was in the kitchen on the counter, ready and waiting to launch himself at the witch if need be. Garth took his place in the shadows beneath the stairs. I waited for Finnick to go upstairs, but he refused to budge. We talked about this, I said firmly. No, you talked and I listened. I'm staying down here with you. Will you stop being so damn stubborn? I complained. I don't want you in the line of fire. He planted his feet and remained put. You going to summon my power, or are we going to stand around all night staring at each other? Gods, you're a stubborn pain in my ass. Ditto. I sighed, but he wasn't about to go anywhere. I held up my hands and recited the spell for summoning lost power. I'd had to change the spell around, so it would focus on a demi's power instead of a witch's, but it came out all right. Some of the rhymes were off. I caught Finnick smiling toward the end, but couldn't stop the spell to join in his amusement. A burst of violet light shot out of my hands and through the windows. It lit the loft and pulsed, sending a new orb of magic along the thread searching for Finnick's magic. Is it working? Finnick asked. It's looking for it, so that's a start. I watched Anther Orb disappear out the window. They started to pick up the pace. I found it. Finnick let his arms fall to his sides, his fingers twitching in anticipation of what was about to arrive at the loft. When the thread shifted from violet to a sickly shade of green, I muttered a few choice words under my breath. Karina's coming. Oh yeah. She's on her way. Battle stations. The green stretched through the window and nearly to my hands. I focused on keeping it away from me, but a sudden influx of dark magic crashed into me and threw me into the far wall. Finnick called my name, but then a loud crack struck my ears and shoved us away from one another. Black smoke filled the apartment as Karina's laugh bounced off the high ceilings. My isn't this quaint, she said as she stepped out of the plume of smoke. I waved the smoke from my face, hacking. Most people knock, I informed her. Where the hell are you going, dressed like that? She glanced down at a black dress that hugged every inch of her body and left little to the imagination. Her hair was loose around her shoulders, and as she took a step forward, heels clicked harshly against the floor. I always dress for the occasion. Her lip curled as she took in my comfortable clothes. You know I would say I'm insulted, but this isn't going to be much of a fight. She reached for a black chain at her neck and tugged it upward. I presume you're after this. The creepy eyeball blinked as she held it aloft. A subtle glow surrounded it, letting me know it did, in fact, hold a demi's power. If I hadn't used a summoning power, I'd say there was a high chance this was a trick. But there was no way she could follow the thread of magic I used, unless it was truly Finnick's power. From the stiff set to his shoulders and the way he clenched his jaw as he glared at Karina, I knew I was right. He took a half step forward, but she clicked her tongue and let the amulet fall. Oh no, Finnick, if you want your power back, I'm not about to make it easy. Why are you doing this? Finnick asked. Taking Demis' powers. Why? 
I would have thought your little witch over there told you all about it. I told him only what you could see, and quite frankly it wasn't much. I shot her an exasperated look. Must suck to know how badass you are, and be relegated to what, stealing power. You know the real part of this plan is all about that portal they're building. That's where they could really use you but no. You're out on the front line seducing Demis. Stealing their power. You're just another mindless soldier taking orders. I bet you don't even know the end game. Her face twisted in anger for a solid five seconds, and I thought I might have her. Then she cackled and waved me off. Please. Do you think I care that I'm out here doing the legwork? It's an honor. Means I'm strong enough to take power from just about anyone. You claimed you took it because I broke your heart, Finnick chimed in. Karina whipped her head around to him. The second that evil intent appeared in her eyes, I yelled a warning but it was too late. She shot her hand toward him just as I started to charge forward. Finnick was thrown into the loft railing and held there by vines. My vines. She twisted them and wrapped them around his limbs to keep him aloft. I was a few feet away when she turned both hands on me. I crashed over the coffee table and into the couch with a grunt of pain. Garth yelled as he rushed out from behind the stairs, but just as he raised his hand to act she snapped her fingers. More vines snaked out and caught his ankles, taking him down to the floor. They covered his body quickly, leaving only his face visible. My shadow lurked behind Karina, ready to make a move, but I shook my head. We had to time this right. I might have wards up to block some of her stronger magic, but she crossed the line. No one used my plants but me. I pushed to my knees as Karina stepped over Garth and focused on Finnick. You think you got under my skin, is that it? she asked him. I motioned for him to keep her talking as I snuck around the couch toward my work table. I did. Otherwise why curse me first? Why not just steal my power that night at the park? Admit it, you fell for me and I was able to hurt you. The great witch Karina caught off guard by one of her targets. He scoffed. Pathetic. I peeked over the couch in time to see her tighten her fist. The vines tightened around Finnick. He gasped as they crushed his chest. You are nothing to me, understand? Nothing. Tell that to the jealous look in your eyes, Finnick rasped. I willed him to hold on a minute longer. I picked through my jars of herbs and found the three ingredients one should never mix together. Ever. Jealous? What on earth would I be jealous of? Who do you think? Her. Karina barked a harsh laugh. She's a simple-minded witch, nothing more. I almost feel sorry for her that she fell for the same seduction I did. Not seduction, Finnick grated as I stood. His eyes found mine over Karina's shoulder, and he smiled despite the pain he must be in. Love. Something you'll never understand. Love. Karina's fist tightened even more, and Finnick threw his head back, straining to get free. You don't know what love is. I'm pretty sure he does, I said loudly. Karina glanced toward the couch then frowned. When she turned around enough to see me, I held up the bundle of herbs already sparking with unstable power and tossed them at her feet. Catch. She yelped as the goblin bark woven with a moonflower, all dipped in freshly liquefied electrified toad berries struck near her feet. The burst of magic tossed her and smashed her into the kitchen cabinets. As she scrambled to get up, I waved my hand over the vines holding Garth and Finnick in place. They released both Demis. Finnick crashed to the floor. Sorry about that, I said with a cringe as I yanked him upright. Fine I'm fine. You bitch. Karina screamed. She tried to move, chucking broken cabinet doors out of her way. My shadow grabbed hold of her feet as Frankie launched his furry tarantula body at her face. She screamed swatting at him. He scurried around her head and became entangled in her hair. Her scream turned into a shrill shriek. I couldn't stop myself from laughing at the spectacle. Frankie made it all the way around her body and snapped his pincers in her face when she grabbed hold of him and hurled him across the loft. Hey! No one hurts my familiar, I snapped, stepping forward with an entrapment spell in the palm of my hand. 
The violet swirling mist pulsed, patiently waiting to be unleashed. Garth moved around the other side to cut her off. Finnick rushed to check on Frankie. Karina sneered and raised her hands over her head. You're going to regret messing with me. She shouted a spell that would set my place ablaze. Only the spell fizzled out. Her hands fell to her sides. She frowned. What? You really don't think I'd pick a fight with you and not be prepared? She snarled. I will end you, all of you. And then I will take his power, she snapped, pointing to Garth. Waiting, I replied. Her hair blew back from her face with her fury. She spread her arms wide. Words dripped from her lips, each one more venomous than the last. The air became thin, as if she was sucking it all to her. I braced my feet, and stopped myself from throwing a look over my shoulder at Finnick. Any second now, any second. Karina shouted the last word of the spell and threw her arms wide. What should have been a full-blown storm appearing in my loft and sweeping us up in it was nothing but a drizzle of rain and one sad rumble of thunder. The storm petered away, and Karina sagged against the counter from using so much magic. What, what did you do? I shifted my gaze to the windows, and the wards now visible there. Might not be as powerful as you are, but I'm a hell of a lot smarter. You won't be using any of that magic in here, not today. Her eyes widened as her chest heaved. She glanced from Garth to me, then the front door. When her eyes returned to me, she straightened, and her jaw dropped and her eyes focused behind me. Slowly, I turned around to see Finnick. He was standing tall, his shoulders thrown back and his body encased in a bright white glow. He clutched the amulet in his right hand. He held it over his head and shattered it in his palm. The pieces fell to the floor soundlessly. He flexed his hands and rolled his head on his shoulders. Damn this feels good. Thank you for returning my power, he said to Karina. The witch gulped loud then sprinted for the front door. I should have been content to watch her go, but she'd piss me off. I directed my hand to the vines hanging from the loft, and they followed the witch. Just as she reached the trap at the door, vines entangled her wrists and bound her arms behind her back. She cursed and sputtered as the trap kicked in, freezing her in place. She glowered at us as he walked closer. See? I told Finnick. It went off without a hitch. Finnick draped an arm over my shoulders and pulled me close to kiss the top of my head. I'm glad. Garth, you all right? Just a bruise or two. You. Like my old self. He nodded to Karina. What are we going to do with her now? I have a few ideas, I said, and Finnick arched his brow. What? It's nothing bad. She did try to use my plants against us though. That's a low blow. Not everyone sees plants the same way you do. Yeah, well maybe they should. I stormed closer and crossed my arms as I looked into Karina's furious gaze. We'll take her to my coven house. The elders will want to question her. As will Dion, I'm certain. Think we can get her there without incident? Finnick rubbed his hands together, then shook them out. Leave that to me. Chapter 7 Finnick Karina continued to dance and laugh as the party surrounding her made its way across the grounds and into the coven house. Beckett shook her head in amazement at how strong the illusion was. That's incredible, she mused. Isn't it? I might have made it too strong. No, this is good. She can suffer for a little while after all the shit she's put you through. Such a vicious side you have. I said as we followed Karina and the four elders surrounding her through the foyer and down a hall to the right. I think I like it. She smiled as she looked up at me. She's lucky she didn't hurt you any worse. I had no doubt at all Beckett would have found a way to get payback if that occurred. Thankfully, it hadn't. Her last-minute idea to have Frankie make an attempt to abscond with the amulet containing my power was what saved us. Karina would have noticed one of us going for it, but not a large tarantula with a bad attitude. We continued down the long hall that ended in a room heavily warded. Karina danced her way inside a cell that had even more wards etched into every bar. The second the door swung shut and the lock was turned, 
My illusion disappeared. Karina paused, her hands in the air, and glanced around wildly. Then she shrieked and charged the bars. They glowed bright blue, forcing her back. Beckett and I approached. Marie joined us. You'll get nothing out of me, Karina warned. Nothing. You can keep me here as long as you want, but I won't turn on my coven. My dear, you're not the only witch in the room, Marie reminded her. We have our ways. Karina crossed her arms. What, like a truth spell? Please. I've been protected against those since I was a child. She tugged aside the shoulder of her dress to reveal a small tattoo. I didn't fully understand the meaning of it, but Beckett shook her head. Sure, why wouldn't she have a tattoo to ward off truth spells, she muttered. No matter, Marie said. One way or another, you will tell us what we need to know. Until then, my dear, enjoy your stay. They'll come for me, she shouted as we turned to leave. You'll see. They'll come here and burn this place to the ground. Marie paused at the door, her face drawn. I thought for a second the younger witch was getting to her, but then she turned with a smile that wiped the one on Karina's face clean off. My dear, the witch who runs your coven is my sister. Let her try. But between you and me, I've always been the stronger witch. Beckett and I exchanged surprised looks as we hurried after Marie. Wait, what did you just say? she asked the elder. You're related to one of them? Sadly, yes. Marie stopped halfway down the hall. She wasn't always this heartless, though. To think she's planning to use demigod powers for some evil means. We told her about our conversation with Dion before we showed up on her doorstep with Karina. She hadn't sounded as surprised as I expected. Resigned instead was how I'd describe her reaction. I haven't spoken to her in years. She shut me out. I'm sad to say I gave up on her. You can't blame yourself, I argued. She smiled softly. Can't I? No matter what family does to us, we can't simply turn our backs on them and pretend they don't exist. It's far better to confront the issue head on. She said the last as she looked to Beckett, who was clearly trying not to make eye contact. I lost my sister because I stopped caring about her. I told myself I was fine without her. Aren't you, though? Beckett asked. Look at all you've done. Yes, and how much more could I have done with her by my side? Now, goddess, now who knows what will happen if we can't stop her from following through with this evil plan of hers. It's different, Beckett argued. She didn't betray you. Perhaps not in the way your mother did, but I understand your pain. I do. Marie's brow wrinkled, then she looked to me. Finnick, might I have a word with you about summoning your father? Beckett waved for me to go, and stalked further down the hall to give us some privacy. Once she was out of sight, Marie told me the elders wished for me to summon Dion. I knew that wasn't everything she wanted to say, and waited patiently. Whatever might happen next, Marie finally said quietly, Beckett needs to speak with her mother at least one more time. It won't be easy, and she'll hate you for making her do it, but we don't know what the Blood Moon Coven is capable of. If there's going to be a fight, we both know Beckett will want to be there. Why are you telling me this instead of Beckett? Because she'll listen to you more than she will to me. She might not say it, but she blames me and the elders for her situation. Not as much as she blames Harriet, of course, but I can see the hint of distrust in her eyes every time she looks at me. Marie grabbed my arm firmly. Please help her do this. I don't know if I can. You can try. That's all I'm asking. You only get one set of parents. I would hate for Beckett to completely cut off ties with her when there's a chance they could still be a family. You have to be one of the most optimistic people I know. I ran my hands through my hair as I paced down the hall, then back to Marie. Fine, I'll do it, but if she turns me into a mouse, I expect you to turn me back. I can manage that. What are you doing to do with her? I asked, nodding to the room holding Karina. We'll keep talking to her, but if she refuses to answer, I'm hoping your father might be able to get her to open up. From what you said, the plans for the portal are in the beginning stages. 
I'm certain all of us would like to halt them as quickly as possible. She tucked her hands into the pockets of her dark red robes. I wished it hadn't come to this. Maybe you can talk some sense into your sister. Marie's bitter laugh filled the hall. It's late for that. Don't worry about me. Just do what you can for Beckett. She walked away and left me standing there with my hands in my pockets, wondering how I was going to go about telling Beckett she needed to have a sit-down with her mom. Shit, I muttered and finally went after her. I found her sitting on the main stairs that lead to the heart of the house. Hey, I said as I sank down beside her. Let me guess, Marie did not only want to talk to you about Dion. Ha, huh, you must be psychic. I'm not talking to her, she snapped. I'm not, so whatever speech you've come up with to try and make me do it, just save it. I never want to speak to her again. I rested my elbows on my knees and looked out the front door. Witches walked along the paths out there, some working their magic, others merely enjoying the early morning hours. I know. I sensed her eyes on me. Then we're good? You're not going to try and convince me. Never said that. She groaned and stood. I caught her hand and tugged her back down. She doesn't want you to have any regrets. I don't. Not yet, but you might. She lost her chance to be a family again with her sister, but your parents are under this roof. I know it'll suck, I do, and I'm more than willing to go with you. I think Marie's right. She glared at the floor as she twisted her hand free of mine. Thinking of being in the same room as them makes me sick. I don't want to see them. I used to think the same about Dion, I said, and she scoffed. Just hear me out, all right. And here comes the lecture. Only because you need to hear it. I'm not going to drag you up there kicking and screaming, but you are going to listen to me. She crossed her arms and stood, but only walked down a couple of steps so she could pace back and forth. Well, let's hear it then. I cleared my throat. Look, before you met me, I hated Dion. I wanted to make him hurt, swore he'd never be my father, ever, after what he did. And granted what he did to me and my mother was an accident, the pain of the reality that I might never know him or really have him in my life was real. Still is. And because of you, I'm getting a second chance. One where he and my mother can have our family back. Completely different situations. Are they really, though? This is like how I felt years ago. You're going to be pissed off. I'm not saying you shouldn't be. But I can tell you, if you let that anger linger, it'll start to eat you alive from the inside out. It'll change you, and not for the better. When she stalked by me again, I entwined my fingers with hers and held her there. I like who you are, Beckett. You're a good person with a warm heart and a kind smile, despite everything you've already been through. Don't let her define who you will be moving forward. Don't let it change you. She hung her head and sank back down on the step beside me. Why did that speech have to be so good? I'm just that awesome. She laughed as she muttered, you're something all right. Okay, fine, you win. But you're coming with me. Didn't plan on letting you go alone. We sat on the steps a few minutes longer, then she rose and started up the steps. Let's get this over with then. The walk through the coven house seemed to amp up Beckett's emotions. She muttered under her breath the whole way. Her grip on my hand increased. We reached the door to her mother's rooms and stopped. Beckett raised her hand, but didn't let it fall against the door. She bit her bottom lip so hard, I waited for it to start bleeding. I gave her a gentle nudge, and she knocked loudly three times. We waited and waited. I gritted my teeth, willing Harriet to just open the damn door and talk to her daughter. When the door did unlock and swung inward, it wasn't Harriet there, but Benjamin, her dad. Beckett, he said, seeming surprised. I didn't expect you to stop by. Yeah, well, I did. Unlike you, when I was lying in a bed after having my mind blasted to an alternate world by my mother. Benjamin blanched and blinked rapidly. You have to understand I was trying to be there for both of you. Why do I doubt that? Is my mother here? 
Yes, she's resting. Great. Beckett shoved past him into the room. I kept my face carefully blank as I followed. Benjamin shut the door and hurried after us. I think we should talk, she told her father. I told you she's resting. Benjamin blocked the door leading to what I presumed was the bedroom. You really should have told us you were stopping by. It's what polite children would do when visiting their parents. I had to stop myself from hitting the guy. How dare he talk to his daughter like that? Beckett shoved her hands in her butt pockets and shrugged. Guess I'm not polite. Must have picked it up from you and my mother. How tight of a leash does she have you on? I mean, really? You didn't come to see me, I'm assuming because she told you not to. You do know what she did to me, right? That she bound my magic from birth. What kind of father doesn't realize that? Benjamin squared his shoulders and lifted his chin. If I had known, I would have stopped it. Why do I feel like some part of you did know, and you were too scared to stand up to her? By the goddess, you let her treat me like a failure all this time, and did nothing. I stood up for you, he argued. When it suited you, she shot back. Even when I was begging you to talk her out of trying to permanently bind my magic, you sided with her. What did I ever do to you, huh? What? Just tell me that much. Benjamin opened and closed his mouth, looking like a fish out of water. He failed to say anything and simply looked at his daughter. Becca turned her back on him and stormed for the front door just as the one to the bedroom opened. Beckett, what do you want? Harriet asked brusquely. Slowly Beckett spun around and stared her mother down. I want an explanation but I know I won't get one, she said quietly, hurt tinging her words. I'd love an apology too, but I doubt that'll happen because you never apologize to anyone. Harriet held the baby bump, visible beneath her sweater. She was a lot further along than I first assumed, and from the way Beckett let out a hiss, it was the same for her. You're just going to start your family over, is that it? Not over, but perhaps this time around, I'll get it right. Beckett's face fell, and something inside her seemed to crack. You know what? I hope you do. I hope the elders don't let you screw up that kid's life as you did mine. Beckett, Benjamin scolded. She held up her glowing violet hand. Don't. You have no right to talk to me anymore, either of you. I'm done with this family. As far as I'm concerned, you are not my parents. She took hold of my hand, me. I'm starting a new family too, and you'll just have to deal with it. Goodbye, Benjamin, Harriet. She turned on her heel, and we walked toward the door. We were almost out of it when Benjamin rushed forward as if to hug Beckett. I blocked him. He frowned, and for a moment I felt sorry for him. Take care of her, he said to me. Please. I will, but not for you. Beckett didn't even look back as she exited the room, with me in tow. We didn't stop until we were outside in the orchard. I said nothing and let her process her emotions. She'd let me know when she needed me. We came to a stop at a small grove, tucked away at the northern end of the grounds. There she sat down on a stone bench, and I joined her. You okay? No, she mumbled and sniffed loudly. This sucks. I know. It'll get better. I wrapped an arm around her shoulders and let her cry. Everything will get better. Has she said anything useful? Nothing. She screams at anyone who goes in there, Marie told Dion. He'd arrived about 20 minutes ago. We'd been working on a plan to make Karina talk, but from the way she was acting, we weren't going to get anything useful out of her. We spoke about simply going to the Blood Moon Coven house and confronting their lead elder, but showing up unannounced would most likely lead to a fight. Despite what the witches were planning on doing, no one wanted to have a loss of life. Dion's hope was this situation could be worked out calmly. He looked down the hall that led to Karina's cell and sighed. I'll speak to her. Threatening her won't work, I said as I walked beside him. Then we use logic. She might be a dark witch, but she cares about those in her coven. They're her family. 
If she wants to keep them safe, keep them from falling victim to the wrath of the gods, she'll hear me out. Marie joined us, but Beckett had stayed behind with the rest of the elders. They were working on a possible game plan if it did come down to a fight. They were preparing wards and amulets that would protect any who came against curses and blood magic, two things Karina's coven were famous for. We talked out in the grove until I knew she was all right, or as all right as she could be after speaking with her parents. It hadn't gone as well as I hoped, but it could have been a hell of a lot worse. I was proud of her for walking away from the situation and not letting her anger get the better of her, as mine had for so many years. At the doorway, we paused and nodded to each other. Marie told the guard to let us in, and he did. The second we stepped through, Karina cackled. She stood as close to the bars as she could, leering at Dion and me. Ah, bringing in the big guns. Even with your power back, you have to run to daddy. Silence witch, Dion ordered, and snapped his fingers. Karina tried to say something else, but no sound came out of her mouth. She glowered as she crossed her arms and raised her brow. You're going to stand there and listen, since you feel inclined not answer any to questions. Dion approached the cell and clasped his hands behind his back, studying her. Whatever plan your coven has will fail. You might believe I'm wrong, but in the end, the gods will win out. That is why we are the gods. We have been around since the beginning of time. Karina rolled her eyes and tapped her fingers on her arm. If your coven decides to attempt this reckless idea of theirs to invade our realm, we will have no choice but to defend ourselves. There will be a great loss of life on both sides. Tell me, do you care so little for your sisters and brothers that you'll let them die horrible deaths? You'll let them march into what will be certain death for many of them. Dion clicked his tongue in disappointment. Are you truly so cold-hearted of a witch to have so much blood on your hands? Karina spread her arms wide, as if to say she didn't care what he thought. Dion tilted his head and snapped his fingers, releasing her from the silence. Well? You're wrong, she snapped viciously. Our plan is flawless. We will succeed. Every witch in my coven is willing to pay the ultimate price to get what we want. Yes. And what do you want? Our power? Our world? Karina's lips thinned. She turned her back on him. Ah, I see. You don't really know why your leaders come up with this plan. Let me explain something to you then, he went on. If she has failed to enlighten you and the rest of your kin, then she herself doesn't care if you live or die. There is a high chance you will die, Karina. That your entire coven will be wiped out. Is that really what you want? To be slaughtered. To be known only as the coven who went too far and got themselves killed for nothing. I waited for Karina to keep yelling at him, but her shoulders sagged and she seemed to curl in on herself. Plus, I nodded to Dion to keep going. You can stop all of this from happening, Dion told her. All you have to do is help the gods understand why it's come to this. Be our go-between. Set up a meeting and let us get to the bottom of this matter without any loss of life. Karina sniffled, and when she turned around, there were tears shimmering in her eyes. Her angry facade faded away, and the woman left standing in that cell was a stranger. She appeared broken down and scared. It was such a switch, I braced myself for her to try and attack us, even with the intense warning. They won't listen to me, she whispered. Please, I've tried to talk them out of it. This isn't what I want. The witch in that cell was not the Karina I knew. I could have called her out right then, but I wanted to see where this was going. Then we will make them listen. You don't have to die, Karina. No one does. I'm scared. I'm so scared. Stealing powers from Demis? It's not the witch I am. Finnick, I'm so sorry for what I did to you, she gasped and started to sob. I did care for you once upon a time. I wanted us to be friends, but they wouldn't let me. They made me curse you to get your power. I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? Dion slid his glance to me. I hated to do it, but I nodded. Of course I can, I said, playing along. 
Thank you. I'll help, she said, turning back to Dion. I will. I don't want a war. My coven is misguided. Together we'll set this right, Dion told her. We will come up with a plan, and then we'll go and see to your coven. I'll need you to be strong. Can you do that? She nodded eagerly. I'll do whatever it takes. Good. Get some rest then. We'll fetch you soon. I kept my eyes on Karina the entire time Dion walked away, waiting for a hint she was faking. She cried harder instead. Dion called for me. I hustled to catch up to him out in the hall. Well, he asked. She's lying. You can't trust her. Karina will not just roll over this quickly. That's what I thought, but if she gets us to her coven house, lowers the warding against gods for our supposed peace talks, then we'll let her believe we do trust her. He clapped me on the shoulder. I must speak with the other gods. We'll leave as soon as the witches are prepared to go. There's one more thing I wanted to tell you. Yes. I hoped Beckett would have been with me for this, but I didn't want to add any more stress to her plate. She was focusing on getting us through the next 24 hours and preventing a possible major conflict between witches and gods. Beckett's found a way to grow a rose that could help my mother, I told him quietly. Don't ask her about it. At least until we get through this mess, but I wanted you to know there's a real chance this will work. Dion's lips quivered as he grinned at me and nodded. Good, that's very good to hear. Thank you for telling me. You're welcome. He turned to go, but stopped. Be careful, son. If what you say about this witch is true, then we will be facing a fight. I would very much like our conversations to continue, so just be careful. You too, old man. His eyes shifted to a deep shade of green as he smiled. Then he walked away, leaving me to catch up with Beckett and let her know the fun was just about to get started. Chapter 8 Beckett This is a trap. You know if you say it a few more times, it might sink in, Finnick whispered with a wink. We know it's a trap. That's why we prepared for it. I don't think we're prepared enough. He kissed my cheek. We're going to be fine. Karina is going to get us in the front gates. That's what matters. The wards will be lowered, and once the gods are in, then there's no stopping them even if it is a trap. Which yes I know, he said, speaking over me, that it is undoubtedly a trap. I fiddled with the star pendant around my neck. The magic within it would protect me from curses and blood magic. All the witches from my coven wore one. There were thirty of us, including half of the elders. Dion had brought ten gods with him, as well as a few demis, including Finnick and Garth. We were a pretty impressive fighting force, if I did say so myself, but I had no idea what was waiting for us just beyond those tall stone walls. The black iron gates blocking the drive shimmered with imbued magic. Karina stood at the front of our group, with Dion. She wrung her hands like she was nervous. I had to give her credit, she was a damned good actress when the need arose. Announce us, Dion told her. Now, if you please. Right, yes, yeah, sorry. Karina cleared her throat loudly, then approached the gate. Beatrice. I'm here and I've brought gods who wish to speak with you. A heavy fog rolled in around our feet. I nudged Finnick, pointing to it. The long winding road leading to the coven house tucked away in the countryside, was lined with blackened trees and thorny bushes. Marie, the witches and I had been checking for wards the entire way here, but there hadn't been a hint of magic, not until we neared the wall. That fog though, where was that coming from? Beatrice? Karina yelled. I heard you, my child, a woman's voice flowed from behind the gate. Her black dress trailed behind her and her smile made my skin crawl. Her eyes shone red with the glow of her magic as she approached the gate but didn't open it. I see you've brought quite the following with you, Dion. As I told you, I would. Marie has agreed to oversee this meeting. She and members of her coven are here as witnesses, nothing more. As agreed upon, Dion stated. Beatrice was suddenly flanked by four more witches, all of them dressed in black. Two men and two women who stared through the bars. Leaves crunched to my right. 
I peered through the fog to see what was there. The haze was too thick. I could hardly make out where the trees were now. I shifted away from Finnick's side toward the edge of the road, nodding to Todd as I did. He was one of the witches who had tagged along. He frowned but came with me as we moved one step at a time deeper into the fog. What is it? he whispered. Not sure yet but I don't like it. The fog swirled around our feet and pressed against my skin, almost as if hands were reaching through it trying to grab me. My fingers stretched, ready for the magic I was about to call forth in case this went sideways. Open the gate, Dion demanded, and we can begin these peace talks. I'm afraid I can't do that, Beatrice called out. Not until I know for certain this isn't a trick. We're just going to have to trust each other in that regard, Dion replied. We have come here under a banner of peace to discuss why you wish to invade our realm. Beatrice huffed. I would think it obvious. Wouldn't you? No, I don't. If you have issues with the gods, we've come to hear you out in person. This is your chance. Do not waste it. The gate swung open, but Beatrice remained inside the walls. I won't waste this chance. You can count on that. You know, she said, her voice barely carrying through the dense fog, I wondered if you'd be stupid enough to show your faces. Stupid enough to come without sufficient backup. It would appear I was right. Such a lucky witch I am. You'll gain nothing if you do not speak with us, Dion warned her. Beatrice's cackle cut over his words. I'll gain plenty. Now. I whirled around in time to see Karina sprint away from Dion's side. Beatrice tossed her something silver. Karina caught it and threw it into the middle of the road where we all stood. The second it hit the pavement the ground shook and cracks formed. A large stone totem rose out of the road and towered over us. The face carved in it was monstrous, mouth gaping open greedily. When the eyes burst to life, burning red with magic, I shouted for Dion to get the gods out of here. Too damn late. The fog came alive as red bursts of magic shot out from the totem, electrifying the mist. It only made the hairs on my arm stand up, but Phoenix's yelp drew my gaze. The fog had closed in around him like ropes, trapping his arms to his sides and forcing him to his knees. His jaw clenched as he fought to get free, but it was no use. I sprinted for him, only to be blown off my feet by an attack from the trees. Palm stung me. I bit back a cry of pain and sprinted toward Phoenix, ducking under curses and shockwaves as the fighting intensified. Told you. I muttered when I skidded into Finnick's side. Later, all right. He tugged on his arms but the electrified bands held fast. Damn it. I can't move. I feel weak. I ran my hands around the bonds, then spotted a tiny burst of electricity running from them to the totem. They were hard to see, but every god and demi had one trailing from them to the totem. Shit. It's draining your power, your life force. It's draining everyone. I have to get you free. I'll close your eyes. Finnick did as I asked, as I focused on breaking those bonds. My hands burned a bright violet light as I used every spell I could think of for freeing a bound object, but nothing worked. My magic ricocheted off and nearly struck me in the face. As a last-ditch effort, I attempted to transform Finnick into a mouse, hoping the bonds would fall off, but that too backfired. I ducked at the last second and watched as a tall witch charging toward me was struck in the chest. He went from being over six feet tall to squeaking at my feet. I smirked as he ran away, disappearing through the fog. I can't get you free, I told Finnick as I went back to desperately pulling on the bonds. I took quick glance behind me and noticed Beatrice finally stepped away from the safety of her walls. Damn it. The totem, Finnick said, his voice growing weaker by the second. Destroy it. Might work. Or it could backfire and kill you all. No other choice. Do it. The totem was in the middle of the fighting. I had no way of knowing if I could even reach it, let alone destroy it once I was there. This was magic I'd never seen before. Crazy strong magic. I hesitated as fear took root. Beckett look at me, Finnick urged. I did, and those shifting eyes held my gaze steady. You can do this. You're a strong witch. 
You're powerful. You can save us. If you don't, the power that Totem steals will be used for their portal. They'll move up their plans and more people will end up hurt. Yeah right just lay it on, I muttered. I cupped his face and kissed him. Hang on for me. Just hang on. Don't plan on going anywhere, he replied sarcastically. Leave it to him to keep that attitude, while there was a very real chance we were all going to die. Staying low I left Finnick and darted for the totem. A curse struck me in the back, but the star amulet warmed, absorbing the effects. I landed a few spells of my own, sending witches flying back into the trees, their shrill cries making me smirk. I didn't plan on hurting anyone permanently, but I was not about to let the Blood Moon Coven win. Or Karina. Mostly Karina. I sprinted around several duels, then finally reached the totem. The stone hummed with all the power it absorbed from the gods. Time was short. I pressed my hands to the totem and focused on blowing it up. I ran through spell after spell of destruction, all the while ducking and dodging more attacks. Todd and Marie came to my aid, both haggard. I waited for Marie to say she could take care of it, when suddenly Beatrice was there. Get away from my totem, she screamed and drew back her hand encased in red light. Marie shifted in front of her though, and a shield fell over me, keeping me safe. Sister, Marie said to Beatrice as she placed herself between the dark witch and me. Did it really have to come to this? I'm afraid it did. Shall we? Marie's hands glowed with her own magic as she nodded. If you insist. A huge part of me wanted to watch the showdown, but I had a totem to destroy and no idea how long this shield would keep me safe. I shook out my hands and I bounced on my feet, glaring up at the evil face. All right you bastard, you want to play? Let's play. I stopped focusing on the totem as a whole, and searched the ground around it. Dirt had come up with the totem, as had bits of plant life. That I could work with. This close to a coven house, and a natural source of power. These weren't just normal plants. They had a hint of magic to them. I sought it out and tugged and pulled with everything I had, until vines and fungi sprouted out of the pavement coming through every crack. What are you doing? Karina shouted, from behind me. No stop. Around me, the shield shuddered. Todd yelled a warning, but I was too focused on my task to look away. The vines and fungi grew higher, until they wrapped around the totem from bottom to top. I tightened them more and more, until bits of stone crumbled beneath the strain. Sweat beaded on my brow, and my strength waned, but I was so close to defeating this dark magic. So damn close. I had to do it to prove everyone wrong, including myself. I was not a failure. More plants sprung up from beneath my feet and joined the others. Flowers bloomed and soon the entire totem was covered in foliage. I pressed my hands together and squeezed with everything I had. The plants mirrored me, crushing the totem. A loud resounding crack echoed through the fog as the stone split right down the middle. Karina's panic scream was joined by Beatrice's and so many others, but I tuned them out. The plants continued to crush the totem, and finally it exploded into little shards of stone. I hit the ground hard, and rolled over in time to see a column of shimmering blue and violet bubbles rise from where it once stood. The electrified bonds on the gods began to falter and collapse as the fog lightened. I rose, ready to check on Finnick, when something slammed into me from behind. Two hands reached around me, and the chain holding the protective amulet was yanked away. It clanked to the ground but couldn't see it. Another burst of magic struck me in the back, and I gasped from the searing pain. I tried to summon my magic, but it faltered at my fingertips. Karina came into view, a crazed look in her eyes. You, how did you of all witches manage to do this to us? You shouldn't have underestimated me. I tried to pull on my magic again, but whatever spell she cast against me was making it hard to do so. Something I won't do again. Karina held up her hands, and a blast of magic slammed into my chest. I gasped for air, fighting to breathe as it surrounded me and hurled me backward through the crowd of fighting witches. I threw my arms up to try and form a shield, but a second blast shattered what I managed to form, and I was thrown further down the road. I'll be sure to send Finnick your love, 
before I finish him off too. I pushed up on my elbows and glared at her over my shoulder. I might not be able to use magic as well as she did, but that wasn't new to me. I dropped low, ready to lunge, and as she opened her mouth to cast a spell, I leaped forward and tackled her to the pavement. Her spell misfired, shooting past my head. I punched her, cringing at the pain in my knuckles, then did it again. She rallied beneath me and threw me over her head. She was a lot stronger than I expected her to be. She made ready to cast another spell, but I wasn't about to let that happen. I aimed another punch at her face, but she blocked it and nailed me in the stomach. I sank to my knees and coughed, struggling to get air into my lungs. You won't win this fight, she said as she stalked around me. Let's see what kind of curse shall I place on you. Oh, I know, and this is a good one. How about we make it so you can never see or hear anything ever again? Blind and deaf, and I'll take away your sense of touch too. You know what? How about I just steal all your senses? I tried to spin around and tackle her again, but she threw her hand out, and ropes caught hold of my arm and tied it behind my back. My other arm got the same treatment and then I was trapped. I scanned the crowd for any sign of Marie or Dion or Finnick, but many of the gods were still too weak from the power drain to move. Karina's eyes glittered as she worked the curse between her hands, building it until a large glowing green orb shifted between her hands, waiting to break free. Enjoy your new life, Beckett, she crooned, then lifted her hands to unleash hell on me. Chapter 9 Finnick The fight carried on. I lost sight of Beckett. Karina screamed. A few moments later, the totem exploded into a column of bubbles. She did it, I whispered, as the magical bonds draining away my power fell away. I tried to stand, but my knees wobbled. I crashed back to the ground. The fighting kept going, even though it was clear the witches were going to lose, as soon as the gods regained their strength enough to put an end to this nonsense. Beckett, I tried to yell but barely said her name above a whisper. I coughed and tried again as I managed to stand upright. Beckett. I trudged forward a few steps, willing my strength to return. I fumbled around like a drunkard, getting knocked down a few times. Each time I rose, more of my strength had returned. A familiar shout caught my attention. I whirled around in time to see Beckett and Karina going at it. Beckett was punching Karina, but then she was on the ground and magical ropes trapped her arms. Karina stood over her, lips moving, but I was too far away to hear the words. The second that green orb appeared between her hands, though, I knew exactly what was about to happen. No, I gasped and stumbled forward. No. Digging as deep as I could and yelling against the last bits of weakness trying to drag me down, I charged through the crowd of fighters like a raging bull. I shoved witches out of my way, urging my feet to pick up speed. Faster, faster. I was so close. Karina raised her arms over her head, and Beckett shut her eyes, bracing for the impact. I lunged forward and clamped my hands around Karina's temples right as she made to unleash the curse. You'll never curse anyone again, I snapped and held on as she screamed and attempted to get free of my hold. Finnick. Beckett smiled in relief. Took you long enough. I turned my attention back to the witch in my grasp. She lifted her hands, but I merely forced more of my power into her mind. Instead of creating an illusion for her eyes to see, I made one appear inside her mind, trapping her within it. It was a party, so she'd have a good time for the first year or so. After that, she might eventually realize what was going on. Her body slumped against me. I let her fall to the ground and rushed to Beckett. The ropes fell away at my touch and she threw herself into my arms. I picked her up and spun her around, kissing her fiercely. Too damn close, I muttered. How about we do not get into a mess like this again for a while? Sound fair? Sounds good to me. She held my face in her hands, then kissed me again. What did you do to Karina? We watched Karina as a smile spread across her face though her eyes were closed. Gave her a party she'll never forget. She'll stay like that until I release her. Probably best for everyone if she isn't disturbed for at least a month. 
probably more. All around us, the fighting quickly came to an end as the gods held out their arms in unison and ordered a halt. The witches of the Blood Moon Coven became frozen in place, including Beatrice. Marie, though, seemed to have her sister contained. Dion approached the leader of the coven and scowled down at her. Why? he asked roughly. Why would you put your coven through this? For what? I want to know, so no other coven tries to do as you have done today. Do you realize how many lives might have been lost? How much blood was almost spilled? And for what power? Beatrice's eyes narrowed in hatred. You understand nothing. You're a god. Try me. You use us, Beatrice spat, and Dion's shoulders tensed. The gods are always using us, witches and mortals. You treat us as if we're nothing, but we too came from something great. We came from the goddess herself, yet we are beneath you. You use us and toss aside. This was our chance to even the playing field. I've heard enough, Victor, a god who was also known for having flings. No, Dion argued and glanced toward me. She's right. Beatrice's look of shock rivaled that of the gods standing beside Dion. What did you say? The witch whispered. I said you're right. For too long we've let ourselves go unchecked. Their goddess has essentially abandoned them, and what do we do? We treat the witches as property, as a means to an end when we should be allying ourselves with them, working to better our world. Dion walked around, and as he brushed by each frozen witch, they regained their ability to move. We've let this turn into a major source of conflict. This wrong must be righted. You've lost your mind. Victor laughed roughly. We all know you have a soft spot for a mortal, but you can't expect the rest of us to follow that path. Dion smiled softly. It's true the love of my life is a mortal, and I will do everything and anything to keep her safe. I'm not saying you should love a mortal, but I am saying it's time we remember who we are. These people are ours to guide and watch over. I feel it's high time we sit with the elders of the covens and create a new plan for moving forward. He shrugged. Perhaps it might be time to even let some mortals know of us. Victor's jaw dropped. This will never work. This is not how we do things. Exactly. Which is why it's time for a change. Unless you want the next coven to succeed in starting a war against the gods. Can you imagine the destruction that will cause? Dion spun slowly around, taking everyone in. I will say, however, this coven cannot go unpunished. For your crimes against your own people and the gods, the Blood Moon Coven is hereby dissolved. No, Marie said quickly and rushed toward Beatrice. I mean, yes, but I don't want them to be without a coven. She took a deep breath and gave her sister an encouraging nod. I wish for them to join our coven. They can have a chance to start over and help remind us of what's at stake when we fail to listen to one another. She held her hand out toward Beatrice and waited. What do you say, sister? Beckett squeezed my arm as she bounced on the balls of her feet. I held my breath right along with her as we waited to see what Beatrice would say. Beatrice finally took Marie's hand, though there was no smile on her face. Is that it then? No other punishment for us. There will be, but I will let your new elders decide that. Dion came toward Beckett and me. You have my thanks, Beckett. You are quite an extraordinary witch. Thank you, she said, her cheeks turning bright red. Now then, we have a mess to clean up here. If you two can stick around and help, It'd be much appreciated. He turned and spotted Karina lying on the ground, a dreamy smile spread across her face. Ah, very clever, Finnick, though you might not want to let her stay in that illusion forever. A few weeks should do it. Then I'll call us even. Dion laughed as he walked away. Just a few weeks? Beckett asked as we looked down on Karina. You're thinking longer. I mean, she did try to curse me, you know. And she lied to your father. And she tricked you. I mean, I did say this was a trap, but you just didn't. I swung her around and cut off her ramblings with a kiss. I buried my hands in her hair. Fine, I'll let it go. For now. Why do I doubt that? 
I mused. Together, we set to work on cleaning up the mess made by a coven driven to craziness by the actions of the gods. Chapter 10 Beckett Six months later I moved the dark soil away from the stem. Out of the five roses I'd attempted to grow the last six months, this is the only one that made it from seedling to a rosebud to a full-blown flower. The deep crimson of the petals was exactly as it should be. When I stood on my toes to peer inside the overlapping layers of red, where the center of a normal flower would be, I found a tiny, shimmering pearl. Well? Finnick asked anxiously behind me. It's ready. He let out a heavy sigh of relief. You're sure? I mean we thought the last ones were ready, but they weren't, and I'm not blaming you at all. I turned around to face him. Now who's the rambler? He wrapped his arms around my waist. Learned from the best. He kissed my forehead then we studied the rose. You did it. You actually brought it back from extinction. Don't say that yet. I said it was ready, but there's a slim chance this won't work. I had to modify the internal makeup of the rose. The magical properties should all be the same once I harvest it and prepare the serum. But there's always the possibility this one won't work. If that happens, we're back to square one. He hugged me close, then let me go so I could get to work. I have faith. You said that the last four times, I reminded him. Yeah, but this is different. I've got a feeling. A good feeling. Can you imagine what this means for everyone else who could use this cure? I bit tried not to let my own excitement run away with me. If this rose did work and brought back Flora's mind, the possibilities of what it could do to help others were immense. I'd have to cultivate a whole garden of just these roses. It'd take patience and time, most of my time, but damn it'd be worth it. I let out a shaky breath then went to work, digging up the entire rose including the roots. Once it was out from the soil, I brushed it clean with my fingers and carried it to the work table. For the last six months, I'd been spending the majority of my time at the coven house watching over my experiment. Finnick and Frankie had seen to the care of the plants I had back at my loft, letting me give all my attention to this single flower. Being here wasn't as hard as it used to be. The witches didn't give me sideways glances of disappointment. They didn't whisper every time I walked past. Well that wasn't true. They did, but it was for an entirely different reason now. I was no longer seen as a failure, but a victim of a witch who lost her way. That, plus it was with my help the Blood Moon Coven had been shut down. I did that. Not my mother. Not some other super powerful witch. Me. The one who was once believed to be failure. Now that the others actually saw me as a witch, I'd been able to share with the elders and the coven what I'd been up to in my loft. To say they were impressed as an understatement. My mother was also here, along with their newborn baby. A little girl named Sylvia. I hadn't been by to see either of them. It was still too painful. Dad had come by once or twice to try and talk to me in the beginning but I ignored him. Saving Flora's mind was the only thing on mine. The fewer distractions I had, the better. After my last talk with my parents, I wasn't sure what was left to say. My mother made it clear that though she was wrong, she would never apologize for what she did to me. And Dad, he might not have had knowledge of what his wife did, but over the years he should have seen the signs. He raised me for God's sake. I told them months ago, and I'd probably have to tell them again, I wanted nothing to do with them. Either of them. My mother would treat Sylvia so much better than she treated me. Finnick believed I could see past my bitterness and be a good big sister, but I doubted it. There was too much animosity between my mother and me to push aside. Marie had informed me the baby would be raised within the walls of the coven house under their watch, so they could ensure what happened to me did not happen to another witch. Our house was much fuller, with the added members of the Blood Moon Coven. They had adjusted well enough. Beatrice was coming around more every day, and even Karina had stopped trying to randomly curse me or Finnick every time she saw us. We'd never be friends, 
but we could stop looking over our shoulders too. As I came to the delicate part of this process of harvesting the rose, I rolled my head on my neck and told myself to focus on the task at hand. One by one, I removed the rose petals and laid them in a neat pile. They would be crushed up and steeped in a mixture of hot water, honey, moonflower extract, pixie berries, and dried goblin root. I plucked the pearl free of the stem and set in a small stone bowl. Taking the pestle, I crushed it down into a fine powder. Little puffs of magic lifted out of the bowl, raising my spirits that this had worked. All the while Finnick kept quiet vigil behind me, handing me tools when I asked for them but otherwise letting me work. Gods I loved him. He was a comfort, and everything I'd been missing in my life. Last night after he'd fallen asleep in my rooms here, I'd snuck out and called Rose. There'd been an idea I'd been toying with for the last few weeks, but had been too scared to follow through. When I told Rose, she yelled at me to stop wasting time and just ask Finnick. Then she'd also added I should stop being a coward, and hung up on me. Crotchety old woman. I smiled, remembering how she'd called me right back and said she didn't want me to waste any more time thinking about doing things. It was time I just did what I wanted. You're nodding. Is that a good sign? Finnick asked a while later. Yeah, a very good sign. I'd steeped the petals and poured it all into a large glass flask. All that's left to do is add the pearl. If it turns navy blue, then it worked. Ready? He nodded and stood on the other side of the table. Ready. I picked up the bowl with the crushed pearl and let the powder fall into the flask. At the same time, I swirled the flask to mix it all together. As the last granules fell into the liquid, I set the bowl down and stopped swirling the flask. There wasn't a sound inside the glass greenhouse as we held our breaths, waiting. Watching. My heart sank when nothing happened, until ever so slowly the liquid shifted in color. It went from red to violet and finally, to a deep glowing shade of navy blue. Is that it? Finnick whispered. That's it. Holy shit, we did it. No, you did it. Beckett, you did it, he exclaimed, then rushed around the table. He let me set the flask down, then he picked me up and spun me around in celebration. We hooted and hollered, drawing the attention of those outside. Marie was the first to rush in, and when she saw us smiling, she broke into a grin. It worked? Can't know for certain until Flora drinks it, but we're on the right path, I told her. Finnick kissed me then set me on my feet. A bit dizzy from his touch, and the realization of what we'd just accomplished, had me grabbing hold of the table and laughing. This is crazy. We're good to go, right? Finnick asked. Yeah, send a message to Dion. We'll head out here in five minutes. Go see your mom. He squeezed my hand, beaming, then hurried out of the greenhouse. Marie joined me at the table and nodded approvingly at the potion. The awe in her eyes was impossible to miss. You are extraordinary. I only wish I realized there was something wrong sooner. You've apologized enough. No, it'll never be enough. We failed you, one of our own. We nearly took away what is rightfully yours. That can never happen again. She seemed to fall into deep thought, then wrapped her knuckles on the table. I was on my way here to make you an offer. An offer? To do what? We're in need of a witch of your talents here at the Coven House. Many lack the skills you have with herbology, and I would like to offer you a job. To what? Teach? I asked, surprised. Yes. This greenhouse is yours whenever you want it. You can make your own schedule, be here when you want for however long you want, but we could use you. The next generation of witches needs to know more than our rituals and spells about the stars. What you've been working on for years is practical, and the applications are endless. She nodded to the flask. I never would have dreamed one of our own would be able to bring back an extinct flower. It's not exactly the same, I said quietly and Marie laughed. You know what I mean. I want to see what you're capable of with the full backing of the coven. And I want to see what you can teach others. You don't have to answer me right this second she went on as I opened my mouth to say I didn't have an answer. Think about it, 
and let me know. We would be honored to have you. And who knows, in a few years, you may yet take your mother's seat amongst the elders. Elder? I muttered as my eyes widened in shock. You want me to be an elder? Youngest since our founding, yes. As I said, think about it. She winked then left the greenhouse just as Finnick returned. They exchanged a few brief words, then he was at my side. Hey, you okay? You look funny. Something wrong with the potion? Huh? Oh no, the potion's fine. I swallowed hard. They want me to teach here, and Marie mentioned something about me becoming an elder in a few years. That's incredible. You're going to do it, right? You think I should? Why wouldn't you? He drew me in against his chest. Think of all those doubters you can show up once you start teaching. Does sound enticing. He beamed down at me, and I laughed. What? I'm proud of you. I just want you to know. Damned proud. And I can't believe I get to be your boyfriend. That still gets me some days. Me too. I nearly asked him then, but nerves got the better of me. I kissed him instead, running my hands through his messy blonde hair as he held me close. If we didn't have a potion to deliver to his mom, we might have stayed there a lot longer. Dion and Flora would be waiting for us, however. I drew back and we both smiled at the bubbles floating around us. Every time. He tucked my hair behind my ears, kissed me one more time, then let me get the potion ready for transport. Once it was safely tucked away in my messenger bag, corked in a large vial, we exited the greenhouse. My greenhouse, if I wanted it. I rested my hand on the glass door, as tears of happiness suddenly burned in my eyes. I quickly wiped them away so Finnick wouldn't see, slipped my hand into his, and together made our way toward the front gate. Dion walked with Flora out of the asylum, and into the gardens. Finnick paced madly back and forth, wringing his hands. I tried to make him stop a few times, but he would just get right back up and start doing it again. I understood his nerves. Mine were fraying, the longer we waited. I was confident in the vial I held in my hand. Confident that I had finally created the cure for Flora's madness. Flora was smiling, but from the way she looked to Finnick when she approached with Dion, she didn't know he was her son. Dion's smile was fake too. That rose couldn't have grown soon enough. Usually, if Dion appeared, Flora would be lucid within moments. If she didn't even recognize him, then her condition had severely worsened. Dr. Gillis was right behind them, his brow furrowed. Ah, more visitors, Flora said as she held out her hand for Phoenix. Such a lovely day, isn't it? Are you here about the sketches? Phoenix struggled to say something. Yes, we are. Oh, that's wonderful. I've just finished a new batch, and can't wait to show them off. Phoenix stepped to the side and let me move forward. This is Beckett. She'll be in charge of getting everything off the ground for you. We have some questions first. Of course, of course. Perfect. I motioned to the stone table behind me. How about a warm cup of tea? It's chilly out today. That sounds lovely. We sat at the table and I slid the glass of tea with the potion already in it over to Flora. I wasn't certain how much of it she had to drink for it to work. I took a glass for myself as well, as did Finnick and Dion. Dr. Gillis hovered, waiting to intercede if necessary. We started talking about Flora's sketches as she sipped on her tea. She was in good spirits today, at least. The conversation continued when suddenly she paused. I was worried, she was having a bad reaction. Dion placed his hand on her shoulder, but she didn't move. Her eyes began to pulse with a navy blue glow that spread outward. It swirled around her whole body, and just as quickly as it appeared, it vanished. She blinked several times as she lowered the glass to the table. Flora? Everything all right? Dr. Gillis asked. She let out a shaky breath, then tears streamed down her cheeks. She clung to Dion's arm and hugged him close. Dion? He sighed in relief and hugged her back. I wasn't ready to be hopeful, as this could simply be another lucid moment. Flora turned from the god she loved to her son, 
and Finnick rushed around the table to get to her. She cupped his face in her hands as she studied him intently. Finnick, my son. I remember you. How do you feel? Dr. Gillis asked. Flora closed her eyes and breathed in deeply. As she let it out, she laughed quietly. Clear-headed. The fog is gone. I remember so much now. What did you do? Thank Beckett, Finnick said. She found a way to cure you. I'd like to make sure though, I said quickly. I'd hate for this to be temporary. Dr. Gillis took Finnick's place beside Flora and rested the palm of his hand against her forehead. His hand glowed, but it only lasted a few seconds. I find no hint of madness anywhere, he informed us. It's gone. It's truly gone. You did it, Finnick told me as he picked me up in a hug. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dion repeated and then he was hugging me too. You have no idea what you've done for us. You'll always be family to us. I want you to know that. If you ever need anything, anything at all, you just have to ask. Flora was next to embrace me, squeezing me so hard I thought she'd crack my ribs. Thank you for saving me, she whispered, then added, and bringing my family back together. When she stood back, she was crying. I was as well. It was impossible not to. I was more than willing to give them some time alone together as a family, but when I started to walk away, Flora pulled me right back and held my hand tightly in hers. She wasn't my mother, but in those few hours together with her, Dion and Finnick, I knew I had a family. A real family that wouldn't use me or turn their backs on me. A whirlwind of intense emotions had me breaking down again until Finnick hugged me. You okay? he asked. Yeah, just ah, uh, I'm just really happy this worked. All because of you. He glanced at his cell then waved to his parents. Hey, we have to head out, but let me know what the plan is as far as moving out. Flora gave him one more hug. We will. Don't you worry about that. Where are we going? I asked as Finnick led me away. I didn't have anything planned. You don't but I do. Just trust me. I always do. He wrapped his arm around my waist at my words and kissed the top of my head. This was just about perfect. The weather was warm, though the cloud cover typical for Seattle blocked the sun. We talked as we walked through the city, meandering and not in any real hurry. Finnick checked his cell a few more times, but it wasn't long until I noticed where we were headed. We're about two blocks from Roses, I pointed out. Yeah, that's right. All right, what's going on? No questions. I planted my feet or tried to, but Finnick simply nudged me along. I continued to bug him about where exactly we were going and what for, until we turned the corner at the next block. We stopped. Rose and Garth stood on the sidewalk outside a storefront. Two large picture windows sat on either side of the door, but they were currently covered with tarps. I knew what was under them, though because this shop space had been sitting here vacant for the last five years. It was a great location, but I'd never felt confident enough to take a chance and rent it. Rose, I said. What's going on? You want to do the honors or should I? she asked. I'll do it, Finnick announced and reached for a rope hanging from a tarp. You ready? Ready for what? I asked. He tugged on the rope. The three tarps fell away. My jaw dropped. No. Yes, Finnick said as he kicked the tarps away and led me toward the front door. Welcome to your new shop, Beckett. Why don't you go inside and take a look around? Numb, I nodded. I glanced at the windows again, decorated in sigils and symbols of herbology. The words on them, as well as the sign overhead, had me shaking my head in wonderment. Tangled vines. Beneath that was written, Herbalist and Herbology Supplier. Shit, I finally managed. Wait till you see the inside. Finnick helped me through the front door, and the second we were inside, I thought I'd died or passed out or something. What do you think? I walked further into the shop and looked around. Rows of shelves lined every single wall, ready and waiting to be filled. There was a large wooden counter toward the front, with a glass case beside it. More display cases filled the open floor space. 
Everywhere I looked there were moonflower vines. They crawled along the floor and up the walls to the ceiling, circling the wrought iron chandelier there. I spun around, then spotted a short hall leading to another door. Hurrying through it, I found a small greenhouse set up at the rear of the shop. A place to grow herbs and other plants, as well as a second workspace set up just like I had in my loft. You did this? I asked, amazed as Finnick joined me in the greenhouse. Had some help but yeah. How? He glanced toward the ceiling and shrugged. Take it as a thank you from Dion and the gods. They asked what they could do for you, and I told them two things. One, give you a shop, a place where you can truly be able to help others. And the second, that is up to you. Your loft is nice, but something tells me you'd much rather not live in the city. If you take the teaching job at the Coven House, you might also want to be closer there, and you can hire some of those witches to help run the store. Basically, they're willing to find you a nice plot of land to call your own if you want it. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. You just say the word. I bounced on the balls of my feet, and though I'd told myself to rehearse a nice pretty speech and ask Finnick the right way, the words sort of tumbled out of my mouth one after the other. Move in with me. His face went blank and then he was beaming. You want me to live with you? I do, I mean if you want to. Goddess, I was going to wait to ask you but heat of the moment, and if you say no, it's fine. But you went and got me a shop and a place to live, and my head's a bit all over the place right now and... Yes, absolutely without a doubt, yes. I sighed in relief. Garth and Rose clapped and whistled from the doorway. My cheeks burned. This calls for some champagne I think, Rose announced. Who's ready to celebrate? We followed her back to the main shop. I was happy to see Frankie had arrived. I leaned against the counter beside him while Finnick poured out the champagne in solo cups. Did you ever think we'd be here? I asked my familiar. Yes. What? No, you didn't. Unlike you, I always believed you were capable of so much more. And look at you, you even found someone to share your life with. Those elevated eyes focused intently on me. You kicked ass, Beckett. You found your destiny. Now be happy. That's the plan, I said as Finnick handed me a cup. Chapter 11 Finnick One year later. Everything was finally set. Today was the big day. I shrugged on my shirt and ran my hands through my hair, trying to make it a little tidier. Dion and Flora would be here in a couple of hours. Rose and Garth were right behind them. I'd invited Marie as well. I considered letting her parents know, but that was her business. I'd let her tell them the news if she wanted to. If she says yes, I muttered to my reflection and blew out a heavy breath. For the last year, we'd been living together in our cottage, away from the city. Beckett was now the owner of over a hundred acres of prime land, perfect for growing everything she needed. Our rustic house had become a home. A place where we spent long nights laughing and talking in front of a fire, long afternoons walking through the trees hand in hand. Where we lazed away on the weekends. There was more happiness and love within these four walls than I'd ever thought possible. And today, I was going to ask that one question that would make it even better. I left the ring in the chest of drawers, not sure yet exactly how I wanted to ask, and headed to the kitchen. Beckett had been up since dawn, taking care of the latest batch of roses she brought back from extinction. She'd helped so many people in the last year. I grabbed a cup of coffee, then left the cottage through the rear kitchen door. The morning air was crisp and cool this early. I breathed it in then walked down the four steps that led to the garden path. Beckett was elbow deep in the dirt when I reached her toward the southern end of the gardens. She wore one of my shirts, her favorite one, tied in front. Frankie was with her, and they were talking about the roses. Good morning so far? I asked, hoping she didn't pick up on my nervousness. Not too shabby, she said without turning around. I can't believe I have this many viable flowers. It's incredible. 
Looks like you've finally got it figured out. Hope so. She looked out over the vast gardens. I might need your help trimming back the twisted bark today. It's got a bit overgrown. And the lilies are coming in faster than I can harvest. I can do that. Good. She glanced over her shoulder and squinted at me. You're up to something again. What? No, I'm not. Sure you're not, she said with a laugh. I considered popping the question then and there and seeing what she'd say. Until she raised her left hand to wipe sweat from her forehead. The glint of sunlight off a silver band with a ruby as red as her roses caught my eye. My lips parted in shock. Something wrong, she asked, clearly trying not to laugh. I rolled my eyes then reached for her left hand. I held it up between us. When did you find it? This morning, she admitted. You, uh, have something to ask me. Not sure I should now, I teased. So dramatic. She sidled closer and looped her arms around my neck. You want to know what my answer would be if you were to ask that question? I can guess. I picked her off her feet and spun her around until she was giggling. When I set her back down, I rested my forehead to hers. Marry me. What do you think? She held up her left hand, admiring the ring. You have such excellent taste. I scooped her into my arms, ready to fully enjoy the lives we found in one another. A demigod and his witch. Thank you for listening. This has been a Ciara Graves book. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new releases.